Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode, recording of an episode of This Week in Science. We are without a Justin Jackson Fly at the moment. Don't know where he is other than somewhere in the state of Denmark. And <laughs> <laughs> if he's sleeping, he probably deserves it as he does have a newborn. And I do know that he was probably up very late at night, Denmark time, because I saw him in the twist rundown this afternoon pacific time but we had a time change what happened in denmark i have no idea fallen forward fallen back we are falling in love with science blair are you ready to record a show yeah i wonder if that's what it, what it is he thinks it's an hour earlier than it is <gasps> oh i bet you he does that is totally what it is. I think our international uh, collaboration has been taken down by the uh, by the magic of time changing, which apparently yeah. Congress has now voted to make daylight savings time. They forever. did it the wrong way. They they did it the wrong way. Yeah, they did. Let's please talk about it in the after show because I'm mad about it. <laughs> we we are definitely going to be talking about the wrongness of the laws yeah. that are yeah. being passed. Oh, good they gracious. did it backwards. They did it backwards. So because close they don't to listen to the right. scientists. They listen no. to the people who like having more sunlight in the summertime. And then they forget about the fact that that's really not very good for people in the mornings and melatonin production and setting your clock cycles. But anyway. I blame capitalism. We can talk more about that later. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's all they think more people go to restaurants and go shopping longer if it's light out at night. That is absolutely what is but going they on. don't care about the human body and how it wants it to be light out when you wake up. <laughs> Fine. <sighs> well, maybe restaurants will open later and people can sleep an hour longer. I have no idea. Extra vitamin D. I don't know about that. I don't think so. No, no. no. Instead, people are going to get in accidents on the freeway because they're driving in the dark. In the dark, and they're still a half asleep. Yep. <sighs> <sighs> the science. I'm so mad about the, it. The science, yes, so does not support a forever daylight savings time. So it we'll talk about a this forever in the after standard time. time. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, let's talk about it in the after show. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let's stop. <laughs> let's talk about it later. <sighs> <laughs> All right. So uh, that is probably we're going to find out when Justin shows up in approximately 45 minutes. That yeah. that is why uh, he's showing it. when he shows up. So everyone be ready in about 45 minutes for Justin to pop on in here. In the meantime, we're going to do the show as we do the show and we mm -hmm. will bring him in uh, and he'll Blair's going to do the disclaimer. Now we'll mm -hmm. get Justin to read the disclaimer later. Mm -hmm. And yes, we're going to talk about these time changes in the after show. So let us begin, shall we, Blair? Yeah, let's do it. With this, this, this show that we like to do on a weekly basis. Yes. Yes. Okay. Let's record this show in three, two, this is twist this week in science episode number 867 recorded on wednesday march 16th 2022 when irish pie are smiling i'm dr kiki and today we will fill your head on this week in science with homeopathy jockeys and a winning mindset but first disclaimer 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 no, Daylight Savings Time did not turn me into Justin. Instead, I am going to read his disclaimer, having never read it before. Here we go. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Of all the things in nature, there are few as perfectly constructed as an egg. Which egg am I, re I am referring to doesn't much matter. But picture, if you must, the egg of a chicken. It has a protective shell able to withstand the weight of a chicken resting upon it. Within the egg is perhaps the very meaning of life explained. Inside are all the ingredients needed. The nutrient building blocks, the instructions of DNA, and eventually a fully formed baby chicken will be living in there, free from the worries of the outside world. Unconnected, self-sustained, and perfectly happy in its little egg world. 
until it's time to break out of its shell and get on with being a chicken. Sent out of the egg life with one overriding mission, make more eggs. People have pondered the question of which came first, chicken or egg. The answer is egg. Egg came first. Chickens are less than 60,000 years old, a relative newcomer to being a species. Dinosaurs, lizards, amphibians all had eggs long before there were birds, let alone chickens. The first mammals were likely egg layers too. Hundreds of millions of years before any of these, fish were laying eggs. But that's the genius of eggs. Fish, dinosaur, turtle, chicken, it doesn't matter to an egg. To an egg, everything is about eggs. <laughs> Every niche of the food web and each adaptation of evolution, the structure of the genome, and every instinct of every life form upon the planet, all just strategies towards making more eggs. More eggs and more episodes of This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. Good this science to you, Kiki. And a good science to you too, Blair. Welcome everyone out there to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back. Well, two thirds of us are back at this very moment in time. Thanks to the changing of the clocks, the changing of the time guard, the rising of the sun. Well, it always it, it rises and sets. We're in a solar system. We're going round and round and we're spinning. It's just going to happen. <sighs> and as humans, humans, we will debate. But <laughs> there is no debate on this show about the weekly science that we like to enjoy. Mm -hmm. We like to discuss. We like to enjoy. And let's see. I have stories this week about eggs. Single eggs, very important eggs. We'll we'll talk about those eggs, cells, and mouse perceptions. Mm. Yes, mouse perceptions. What did you bring, Blair? Oh, I have jockeys. I have uh, sea turtles. I have smelly birds, and of course, elephant tusks. Of course, you have of elephant course. tusks. No, yeah. you would never have ele elephant tusks <laughs> unless it were just oh, yeah? a story. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And I'm as we dream. jump into the show here, I want to remind you that if you are not yet subscribed to This Week in Science, you can find us as a podcast on all the podcast directories, pretty much where podcasts are found. Look for This Week in Science. And we broadcast weekly live on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. We are Twist Science on Twitch, Twitter, and Instagram. If all this naming and citing and mediaing is hurting your head just go to twist.org that's our website where we post show notes and links and all sorts of fun things but just go there and start clicking things you'll find some good stuff just, just click the things you'll find the stuff as you click around yeah oh and it looks as though we have a just woken up justin joining the show hello Hey, did y'all have that daylight savings time thing happen over there? We Cause did. Because it, it, it's not the same. Yeah. It's a little not bit a different. It's a global yes. thing. Mm -mm. <laughs> and I thought you just got rid of that, any? Didn't we get rid of that? The United States get rid of that now? We're talking about that in like the after show, Justin. I'm mad about it. We're going to yell about it later. <laughs> oh. Okay. Did you start they, the show? Start the show? Like, was there a yeah, disclaimer and stuff? We're, we're, yeah, we're in the show right now. Oh, oh this is the actual show. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Sorry, Rachel. Enjoy the edits. <laughs> <laughs> Do you need a minute, Justin? Do you need to pull yourself together? I, I I'm pulling story. uh, stories up. Yeah, go for I'm it. Pulling stories up. Uh, All right. Nothing open. 
<laughs> yeah, I would figure as much. Like, what's happening? Need to drink the coffee. Uh, comb my hair. What? Who? I'm sorry you're awake so early in the morning. But welcome to the daytime. I've got some story, some story, a story that I really am excited about leading off on, especially following Justin's disclaimer about eggs, what the egg wants, what the egg needs. Well, in this story, it's about researchers figuring out what an egg wants in order to, I guess, not have to have a sperm involved. So there is a form of reproduction called parthenogenic reproduction, and we have found it in lots of species other than mammals. And the question is, why don't mammals reproduce parthenogenically? Parthenogenic reproduction is when females of a species just, they go, I'm going to have a baby now. And they just have an egg, it's and that egg, egg is able to divide. Just egg. Eggs. Just, just, just egg. Egg. eggs. Just I don't egg. need so anything. I don't need anything. Is that you you essentially have a duplicate genome. Instead of having half from mom, half from dad, you just get the egg and it just replicates. It just yep. it divides and it, it divides. It, it works off of it. And so my favorite thing about parthenogenesis is depending on what animal is doing it and how their sex uh, chromosomes work, you either end up with all boys or all girls. <laughs> that is fascinating. That is very interesting. Well, uh, researchers just published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, their work in which they used CRISPR to edit the genes of the egg from a mouse so that it mimicked what would happen if a sperm had been contributed during fertilization. But fertilization didn't happen. They just CRISPRed the egg, made it think it had been fertilized by a sperm, and they injected an enzyme into it to get some things kicked off as enzymes tend to do, catalyze reactions. And they implanted it into a female mouse's uterus, and it grew. They did this a number of times, and they resulted in a, a large number of viable offspring. So they had uh, 227 reconstructed oocytes. They had 192 of those oocytes developed to the blastocyst st stage. Blastocyst is when they, that little ball of cells after fertilization decides to start really dividing, dividing, dividing. They transferred all 192 blastocysts into the embryos of females. There were 14 pregnancies. Three of them resulted in live pups, and they had one survive to adulthood. Also, to reproduce itself. Wow. Okay, so but... actually successful adult, not just live, lived and died, but reproduced. So this this ratio is terrible though. It's not a very oh. good success rate. And it's also, <laughs> this is my question. Why on earth would you want this? Because, let me follow up, exactly the thing I mentioned. You end up with a duplicate of genes, right? And so that is exactly why inbreeding is bad. And you end up with detrimental mutations and high mortality rates and all sorts of um, diseases popping up in the offspring hmm. of um, inbreeding, right? And so that is exactly the issue with parthenogenesis is you end up with a higher propensity of mortality of all sorts of diseases. So why would you want to use CRISPR to make parthenogenesis happen in mammals? The There's idea the is that if you only have a female of a species left, uh -huh. you could potentially help to perpetuate that species, maybe not forever, but it could no. <laughs> kickstart things. It would be a severe population bottleneck, uh -huh. genetic bo bottleneck. Um, but you could it could be used in zoos. It could be used in the conservation of species. Um, it could also be used in uh, situations in which human humans, want to have a child but don't want to have a sperm involved um there are, or maybe there are situations in which maybe the male partner or the sperm that would be contributed 
to an, an offspring does have a known genetic uh, mutation that is a problem. And the woman in the relationship, the female, the person with the egg, doesn't want to bring that genetic mutation into the situation. They know that they have great genes. Why don't I just use my great genes? No. Um, I can see all <laughs> sorts of reasons or ways that it could oh, be useful. Man. It's not going to be humanity being taken over by parthenogenic reproduction because, because it doesn't make sense. But there are examples in which it could be useful. I think oh, it only makes out. sense if it's going to be to like one. stop extinction because I feel like it's a huge risk. It's a huge... Um, it, I, I feel like there's a huge uh, ethical issue with trying to do this intentionally because diversifying genes makes a healthier offspring and you're basically welcoming all sorts of problems. What was wow. the reason that we yeah left go out, ahead Justin. yeah go Justin oh it's exactly what you what you were saying all the problems that could come from from uh, uh, attempting to create monotheism in mice <laughs> yeah oh yeah this really makes me feel uncomfortable because I understand why people would think it's a good idea who don't have a deep understanding of the genetic fallout from making this choice, right? Like, so I, I know we're very far away from that. We just made one mouse, but like, is, oof, there's also part of this, is this even better? Is this, is no, this, this better not. for preventing it's extinction not. if you're going to end up with animals that don't live very long or, you know, it's all of these issues. Right. I mean, part of it does help us, you know, the research itself does help us understand Okay, we didn't understand why mammals weren't able to reproduce parthenogenically previously. Now we do know it has to do with epigenetic imprinting, and it is this imprinting that occurs during fertilization that that you or that usually happens that keeps an egg. Sorry, it is the imprinting that happens that causes an egg to not be able to divide itself in mammals, and so the sperm is part of knocking out those. Uh, those markers that keep the egg from starting to divide and doing stuff. And so now we understand a bit more about how the process mm -hmm. works. So scientifically, this is great for potentially working in fertility mm -hmm. for, all, for mm -hmm. humans and lots of other species, even if we never use parthenogenesis ourselves. Okay. All right. I'm on board. Understanding is important. Okay. You, you convinced me. This, okay. this research makes sense. I still don't want <laughs> mammals via parthenogenesis. I think it's a very bad idea. But I your think rhinos? That, what about your rhinos? Mm -mm. They would they would last only a few generations, probably, with all the issues. It's definitely uh, so. But I like would hundred percent do that. Use that as a resort for uh, rhinos. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And you said you Blair, the, you're talking the... about last line of defense here. And you said no in in the species that do reproduce in this way, where the egg just divides yeah. and uh, and copies itself. Sometimes it ends up with all females. Sometimes oh, yeah. it ends up with all males. So you could. So if you did mammals, bifurcate. you'd only you'd only get females because you'd only get XX and YY. So uh, right. y, okay. YY is non viable. So you'd only end up with female offspring. Got it. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That anyway. Is interesting yeah. Most of anyway, the famous. Do it uh, never mind. Yeah. 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 Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Who's next on the science stories? Justin, do you have something? I got, I got, I got some, uh, just when you thought it was safe to go outside again, volcanoes. And not just your, you know, the volcanoes you grew up with either. We're talking pre-post-COVID, post-pre-World War III era type volcanoes. University of Copenhagen physicists studied ancient ice from cores drilled out of Antarctica and Greenland. So you know, bipolar there. Associate Professor Anders Svensson of the University of Copenhagen, Niels Bohr Institute, and associates were able to look back over 60,000 years of the uh, ice core, so longer than there have been chickens. <laughs> <laughs> they were able to look 60,000 years of history, and they were able to piece together that history and magnitude 
of volcanic activity. They were even able in some cases to, to I think uh, on 70, 80, let me look, actually look, see if I can find the actual number. Uh, no, 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 it's not here. Uh, a whole bunch of times <laughs> they were able to actually match up. Uh, 85 times they're actually able to match up the same volcanic activity that affected both poles. Uh, so, so those are really big global uh, affects. So what did this tell them? What did they learn? Well, research revealed that some really gigantic volcanic eruptions have taken place in the past. 69 eruptions were bigger than any in modern history. If you don't remember the largest volcanic eruption in our modern history, and why would you? It was over 200 years ago. It took place in Indonesia's Mount Tambora, 1815. That eruption blocked out the sun, caused tsunamis, drought, famine, caused global cooling. In the years that followed, 80,000 80, people died, but that was in uh, 1815 people numbers. Back then, there were only a billion people on the planet. Today, in today, humans, that number would be about 640,000. Or as COVID likes to call it, a good start. It's supposed to be a good. All right. Uh, so, yeah, 60,000 years, uh, 69 eruptions, 69 enormous volcano eruptions, bigger than Mount Tambora. Three, three of them were in a category of their own, larger than the other 66. So this is uh, quoting Anders Svensson. The new 60,000-year timeline of volcanic eruptions supplies us with better statistics than ever before. Now we can see that many more of these great eruptions occurred during the prehistoric ice age than in modern times. Because large eruptions are relatively rare, a long timeline is needed to know when they occur, and that's what we now have. We can expect more at some point, but we just don't know if that will be in a hundred years or a few thousand. Tambora-sized eruptions appear to erupt once or twice every thousand years, so the wait may be shorter. Uh, they did see a connection between volcanic eruptions and global climate, where post uh, big eruptions, global eruptions, there was a five to ten year cooling period at the global scale. Uh, so yeah, 85 of the eruptions they identified were observed by researchers at both of the, the poles. 25 of these were larger than any eruption in the past 2,500 years, while 69 were larger than the 1815 Tambora eruption. And the largest eruption on record uh, that uh, in the last, which was the largest in the last 500 years. So, yeah. But you know it's going to happen now, right? Like, what? this is right. Like, it's going to be COVID, World War Three, and, <laughs> and super volcanoes. <laughs> oh, no. and an earthquake, tsunami, just do it all. Oh, the 7.3 so, off the coast of the Tokyo was good. And the famine and the tsunamis and all the massive death, yeah. compared to COVID numbers, really nothing. Yeah. Right? Eh, nothing. We can handle Walk that. in the park. Uh... Hey, five to ten years of global cooling wouldn't be such a bad thing. Silver lining. Right. People might the global even think cooling about aspect of super of volcano. Yeah, yeah, sure. For some things, <laughs> but there would be like, you know, die offs from not as much sun and, you know, not enough yeah, food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. plants yeah, yeah, and animals yeah, yeah. dying because of the cold yeah, yeah, snap yeah, yeah, that yeah. happens super fast. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. You know. But silver lining, <laughs> yeah, last yeah, yeah. line of defense. We'll save this one. <laughs> We'll make this like the part of the genesis mm. for the species. We'll save this one for last. But okay, uh, so things, an things we're putting now. on the list for how to save the planet: Parth yeah. parthenogenesis <laughs> and volcanoes. Yeah. Super. We sound like super villains now. No, we don't. It's like no, no. I was trying to <laughs> save the planet by firing my laser into the volcano to make yeah. it. Yeah. No, you guys don't understand. I'm helping. <sighs> Blair, tell yes. us how we're gonna win the race. Yes. Well, it turns out it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. Great. <laughs> wait, what, University of Nottingham has done a study to figure out wait, if it wait. matters if a jockey is a man or a woman. Oh, this is in what riding a need. different athlete. Oh, yeah, Science. that makes sense. 
four, I guess. Um, so I apparently there is a huge expectation in the the horse racing world that male jockeys are stronger, they're able to push the horses harder, and they thus perform better in races than female jockeys. More than 90% of jockeys in most racing nations are men. Um, I thought it was like basketball or something like that where it was a men's league, I assumed, because I had only ever seen male jockeys. No, women... And men there can are both female jockeys. Be jockeys. Yeah. I didn't know that, but it turns out the reason I didn't know that is because ninety percent of them are men. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so there's I'm actually this... surprised it's not even more than that. But yeah. yeah, yeah. So there's this baked in unconscious bias that men are going to be better <laughs> at this. Um, and so there was a study to look at the effect of sex on of a rider on racehorse performance and physiology um, during training. And they they found uh, this is this was only possible because to your point, Justin, there was a marked increase in per participation of female jockeys um, in the last decade. And so it's only at 90 percent now because there have been way more in the last 10 years than there ever have been before. And so they were able to look at 530 thoroughbred race horses ridden by 103 different riders, 66 male, 37 female, at a total of 3,568 workouts at a single racing yard in Australia. They looked at speed, stride length, frequency, horse's heart rate, rate of recovery. They recorded all these things with a fitness tracker. And um, they found no effect of the sex of the jockey on any objectively measured outcome variable. Then they looked at 52,464 races and found that female jockeys had a very similar win per percentage to male jockeys. 10.7% female versus 11.3% male. So they found a minimal effect of the sex of the jockey on both training and race outcomes. So I... I'm not surprised to hear about this. I, I'm not bringing this because this is breakthrough science. I bring it because <laughs> this is a really good example of using science to just do a, a, a comprehensive look at why we have certain expectations and whether they're based in any fact. And guess what? It's not. Yeah. So, so if this was almost any other athletic uh, competition, I would have objected and said, ah, no, it's definitely meant. Like, you shouldn't, like, there's a reason, there's a reason why you have sex-divided sports. And this is a whole slippery slope, and that people are like, oh, but then how do you define sex and everything else? I'll just say, if you were born a woman, don't get into a fighting ring with a born a man. <laughs> I, I don't it's, know. I, no, I depends. Justin, you, maybe we need some studies to figure this no, out. No, we need some studies. It, they've they've actually mean, tried it. They've actually tried it in fighting events before. It's the of worst men and thing women you've who ever are seen. the same yeah. size, who are like yeah, the featherweight yeah, yeah. or the welterweight. The, the or, top yeah. woman with the like middle trained average Joe fighter guy. They've done it in boxing. They've done it in kickboxing. They've done it in mixed martial. It ends very badly, and it should never be done again because it it looks like domestic abuse. It looks horrible, and and I'm I not kidding. Okay, it, there, I, I, there's certain spot. Okay, you can look it up. Fine, talk fine. About it later. But I'm just I'm just but, wondering if they've if they've have done this like you're saying within the sport. But I mean, you don't want like a a five foot five foot knot person up against a seven foot tall mon you know and they have like, weight classes too they do have weight I know classes, they have weight too. classes and that would be part of that and that should be part of the determination but that's not what this is about necessarily no, right. this is somebody no. who this, sits this on a horse a because actually it is to your point exactly, and it's very specifically because, weight and and yeah, leg yeah, strength actually, very, very specifically <laughs> to your point yeah what you're saying though in a way i never thought about it like it is a weight class if you can get down to the weight class of, what is it, a 10-year-old boy? I'm not even sure. They're very small. You have to be very slight to be a jockey. You can't be a grown average person. So jockeys, can't. jockeys, just so you know, since this is kind of what you're asking about, they're weighed yeah. in before and after races. 
and there is a handicap based on weight. So the the race is adjusted for the weight of the jockey, and this study was also adjusted for the, so they took that variable away, right? And so this is something somebody asked in the chat room, isn't a lighter jockey more likely to win? Um, and sometimes depends. There's a lot of, of actual um, kind of skill that goes into kind of steering the horse and pacing the horse and all these sorts of things. So there's other things that go into it, but yes. And so you might expect that a woman might actually do better than a man because overall they might weigh less, right? But but they're adjusting for that variable, right? So that variable is not it. We're not asking who weighs less, who weighs down the horse more, right? We are asking all other variables erased from the equation, who is doing the best job as a jockey and it's equal. And I understand mm -hmm. what you're saying, Justin, and I understand that that may be true. I also know that there that there part of it is optics, so you might be foreseeing something because of expectations of how something looks, and that's one of the things that you mentioned, right? And so I, I also just challenge that this is an excellent opportunity to use data to mm -hmm. actually look at what's happening in a space because yes, the way that something looks might might impose a narrative that may or may not be supported by the data involved. So I'm just wait, 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 what are we talking about? Because I got confused. So, but my point was that uh, I would think it would actually be easier for females to get into uh, or to have that to weight jockeys. class and right. that jockey thing. So, and, and I mean, I'm envisioning a 90% female if their interest is there. Because there should be more candidates that fit the weight class. There just should be the size and weight class. Should it's sort of should like, is not what is, and the yeah, science. Yeah, it's sort of like uh, when is when what they, we're seeing. they went yeah. to the 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 uh, that cave where they okay. they discovered Homo naledi, and they were putting out the request for slight build, you know, archaeologists, preferably with spelunking ability. And I think it was something like to fit into under the cave, five because they had one. to be tiny. Yeah. Yeah. They ended yeah. up with an all female crew. And I think it's just, you know, by the numbers, you're it's just how things work, right? Well, they except culture more... comes into who ends up being a jockey, and that is a male dominated culture up to this point. So that also is gonna impact who's gonna go into training for the sport. There's a lot going on. Um, I just oh, wanted oh, to bring this story to talk about the fact that. It might be worth bringing some data to these yeah. preconceptions. I'm glad you did because I don't know how I would have put my foot in my mouth without <laughs> talking about gender equality if you hadn't <laughs> brought that story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> believe it or not, that was not the reason I brought it. <laughs> but here we are. <laughs> Oh, here we are. Here we are. Here we are. And you know where we are? We are in this wonderful place in time where we have sent a an optical space telescope out to a Lagrange mm -hmm. point. And we didn't know whether it was going to be able to get past its 300 some odd challenges of things to fail. and. NASA just released the first image from the Webb Space Telescope. They have successfully aligned all of the mirrors in the telescope. And they this image they released is what they say. It's like the best you can possibly get from a telescope this size. Highest resolution image, highest yeah. fidelity, highest focus. And the interesting aspect of this is it's focused down to basically like quantum levels it's the diffraction limits of each of the mirrors coming together and so the image itself has beautiful diffraction and even galaxies that you can see in the foreground and background of the, the focus star that they they chose um, are in focus the galaxies around it are also in focus the so there is wow. so much that is going to be seen from the space telescope yeah. when they're ready to really start doing science with it and at the moment it's not quite ready because there's still a couple more instruments that they have to calibrate with the mirrors to make everything work but may it sounds like may they're really going to get going and be able to start looking 
off into the universe. So the, at least the picture that they've put up of this looks like a 1970s sci-fi lens flare. It does. <laughs> I, I saw that image and I'm like, well, really? The thing you're trying to look at, you can't see it all. Really, it's just all lens flare, all of it. It looks cool. Because it's a star. It's anything. a point source. It's a point source of light. But the. Yeah, uh, I don't think that. I think that. Is that a little bit artistically uh, <laughs> image thingy? Not a useful. Because it's. Yeah. Mm. It's all the stuff around it. It's all the stuff around it oh, that's very important. That's the interesting. Amazing. Yeah, the stuff around it is the stuff that's very cool. The ability to be able to peer into the dust because that's really what web is going to be so useful for not the light it is an optical telescope and yes we're looking at light but it's infrared that we're focused on infrared mm -hmm. is going to be the heat the spectra of heat in the universe not just the light the, the visible stuff the rainbow spectrum that we love to look at um but yes it's very exciting. It's very exciting. Mm. Images to come. Technology for the win. Woohoo! <laughs> Justin, tell me another story. All right. Uh, it's time for that sporadically produced yet unyieldingly questionable segment of the show. Did we really need a study for that? Homeopathy <laughs> edition. <laughs> So there's very little evidence offered uh, for homeopathy treatments, cures, immunizations. That said, occasionally there are randomized controlled trials performed. These aren't exactly studies, but they are trials where, you know, this many people were given this microdose, I guess it would be, of something over this period of time uh, to attempt to relieve XY conditions. So scientists at Danube University, Krems in Austria, looked at a large sample of these trials. I think they ended up with 97 by the end. They started with the larger one and had to wean it down to the 97. Found that they lacked basic scientific method methodology and uh, were, were riddled with red flags. And this is in the way that the trials were, were sort of conducted and reported. The proper way to do a clinical trial is to register it. And there's many organizations that you can register with. There's a few really big ones. They're usually government or institutions. And so you register the details of the research you are about to do. And so here's the number of people involved. Here's our methods. Here's what we're testing. Here's how we will evaluate our outcomes. Here's the outcome that we're going to measure. That's a big, important one. Here's the thing that we're going to... You don't just give somebody uh, like a, a new drug or something, and then we're just going to wait and see what happens. So we've given this drug to a number of people of different ailments, and we're going to see if it cures one of them. That's not that's not experimenting. That's guinea pigging, but that's not experimenting. If you're doing a trial, you should already know the outcome that you're looking for at that point. Okay. So part of the purpose of, of registering in advance is so when you, that you first that you follow through with publishing your results you're saying here's the study i'm going to do you do the study and then you publish regardless of the results it's it's a it's a sort of a way of of creating a level of credibility but removing bias from publishing because you've already announced, here's the research I'm going to do, and you follow through with it, and you publish it. And people know, before they even did this study, before the outcome was there, they had already laid out how this study was going to proceed. That way, nobody can change the study if they get a different result or just decide not to publish. Okay. Um Yeah, so uh, important safe safeguard against, say, running... 50 studies, 50 trials, uh, uh, to, to, and then only publishing the one where smoking hemlock looks like a really good treatment for whooping cough, which you shouldn't have had in the first place because there's vaccines for that. But okay, why bother when you can smoke hemlock to make it go away in one of 50 uh, trials? Registering trials is important. 
that's my whole point. 38% of homeopathy trials were registered. So they did register, but were never published. So that's a big red flag. They ran the trial. Hmm. They did the study. They got a result and they decided not to publish that result. That's a red flag because that, why you would not publish it? That's cherry picking. But I mean, in in science, very often negative results or null results are not published. Researchers tend not to publish them all the time. I mean, this happens in, this happens all over the place. We complain about this all the time. But not in clinical trials. When they do a right. clinical, uh, a randomized clinical trial, mm. a drug company will publish the result. It's like, here, this is their pipeline of, here's what we looked at, or here's yeah. what we're going to look at. Then we looked at it. We got it. You hear this all the time. Oh, poor big pharma company XYZ, they, their trial for this to treat that didn't work. Didn't look good after all. Now the investors are dumping a stock. Okay, Whatever. Hear about this all the time. So 30, 38% of homeopathy trials decided, eh, eh, don't like the result, not going to publish. 53% of the published homeopathy trials were never registered. So for every one of those, there could be 50 trials where smoking hemlock didn't get a favorable outcome. Hmm. I wonder right? why that would happen. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't know. Oh, yeah, it's poison. You didn't die. Right. Uh, Socrates died that way, I think. I think he smoked. <laughs> oh, no. This is so you can say 100% of published studies show negative results. No, this is so you can say 100% of published studies show. Exactly, exactly. Well, they, there's one of the other things they point out, too, is like any time. I don't know if they publish. Actually, they, pu- they point that out in the study. Uh, but one of the things you should, uh, homeopathy, if it says this product cures X, Y, and Z, and uh, that's probably homeopathy. It's probably not true. Most, most actual products that we use, we use to treat symptoms. Yeah. There's very few cures for anything in this world. Just just note, if you see cure on a packaging, eh, might want to take another look at it. Anyway, uh, where was I? Okay, so of the trials that were published, right? And, and there's some percentage of the ones that were published also that uh, that did end up registering, but only after they published, which seems like you shouldn't be allowed to do it at that point. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they, can't, they, yeah. they then register after they published the study, they then said, oh, here's the register. the study we're going to do. Oh, by the way, yeah, we already did it, though. Like, that's not it's not the right order. Of the trials that were registered and were published, some of which, again, were registered after they were published, 25% altered or changed completely the primary outcome mm-hmm. in the published version. Wow. So, yeah. Pri- okay. So uh, primary outcome you, is, is basically you have to choose that ahead. It's like c- calling your shot in pool. It's, it's, yeah. Uh, it's, it's you it's say this hypothesis. is what we're going for. Yeah. This is what yeah. we're looking for. This is yeah. how we so know our study is successful or our hypothesis is successful. Exactly. So the idea is uh, uh, in the registered study, uh, you've got your, uh, whatchamacallit there, your primary outcome. You called your shot. That uh, study is smoking hemlock to treat whooping cough. Primary outcome hypothesis being less coughing. And you might even define it by a number. 10 coughs per hour is bad. Less than five is good. Two or less would be great in terms of your outcomes. Uh, and then you publish. And in the published version, it's 30 cops per hour is bad. Uh, less than 15 should be considered good. And 10 or less is great. Just completely yeah. altering the goalpost. So that was in some of them. Or worse, they changed the primary outcome into something entirely different. And this is the sort of like, you know, whooping cough study results in acne cure. something completely off target they decided oh no that's now the point of the study Uh, and there's a homeopathy even when they have a trial 
even when they make a paper, is still not doing science. It's a, you know, question though is, uh, as part of the segment, did we really need a study for that? Homeopathy is already an unregulated, grifty feel to it kind of a uh, business. And since those who believe in it tend not to trust science, a study by scientists about, about why you shouldn't trust homeopathy is a lot like singing at a choir. I don't know. I still think it's helpful. I I like to hear actual actual numbers, actual information about how much smoke and mirrors are involved with homeopathy. Um, just because, I mean, you're right. A lot of people who follow the teachings of homeopathic medicine don't want to hear really. from scientists. However, as is the case with many controversial topics related to science, they may be interested in having a debate or a conversation with someone that they know who is not a scientist. And so this is information that you could give to someone to bring up to a friend who maybe doesn't know that, that their, their homeopathy is not based in actual trial reliable yeah. and reliable there's research nobody, yeah. it's, i think it, i think at that point there's nobody left in their social media feed <laughs> so I'm you not, have the like, conversation a... in person i don't know i think there are people out there who believe in homeopathic medicine who don't understand how separated from from medical science it is i do believe that is the case there are people that don't know that it's, so yeah, yeah, okay. So actually, we did need this study then because I think we did. That's how that's science how. works. It yeah. does the study. It doesn't just assume and guess things. And it's also, I think, important because to note because homeopathic cures, uh, the, at least from the study, were uh, in 2018. So before the pandemic era, was a 5.5 billion U.S. dollar industry around the world. Which is why we have to get on board now. Every one of us and everyone out there listening right now, you're on the first floor ground tier of a brand new triangle-shaped homeopathy campaign to study solarium-infused sugar pills. What you do is you take something with sugar in it, hold it into direct sunlight for a period of time, then eat it and report back to us what it cured. We're going to publish this I love this study. study. <laughs> it's done. Let's do this, oh, man. Uh, Blair. Yes. You had some some news. Oh, yes. I have some good news. Some good news. But but just Blairly. Just Blairly. Yeah. <laughs> this is this is Blair's segment in response to Justin's <laughs> good news segment. This is okay, the good I'm, news, but careful, just Blairly segment. Careful, okay. it, like, next week, I'm going to have to come up with like a. Justin's <laughs> animal annex or attic oh, no. or something. Oh, well, get... You'll never survive <laughs> really in there. Um, a half set. <laughs> okay, so a half century of protection pays off for sea turtles. This is good news. The uh, at the Aldabra Atoll in the Seychelles, there has been a ban on turtle hunting since 1968, and since then, turtle numbers have skyrocketed. They have gone from about 2,000 to 3,000 eggs per year in the 1960s to more than 15,000 in the data collection period of 2014 to 2019. Um, that's Sorry, that's not individual eggs, clutches of eggs. Sea turtles <laughs> lay hundreds of eggs in one sitting. So yes, that would have been bad. Um, but anyway, so the, so the egg... The egg numbers are skyrocketing since turtles have been um, taken off of the hunting kind of menu. And so this study demonstrates the importance of long-term monitoring. So it's not often the most glamorous part of research, but the long-term monitoring of something like this shows you what's working. And so it takes decades for a long-lived animal like a turtle to rebound after you illegalize hunting them. But it shows that commitment to that ban and to collecting the data afterwards can show the benefit to making these sorts of regulations. And so they now these Aldabra green turtles could be a conservation success story that we could use as a marker for future 
studies. The reason I, I say this is good news, but just blarely, is <laughs> that I want to remind everyone that turtles um, are in big trouble from climate change because of the fact that they have temperature-dependent sex determination. So um, as uh, the temperatures rise, there are more and more, uh, in most cases, in most turtle species, more and more females, which means um, you, if, if you have an unequal percentage Unless you're going to use parthenogenesis, you, you are not going to be able to see populations rising. So it's important to make these changes now before the animals have other issues that cause further problems. It's like, it's, I always think about that um, there was an episode, I'm sorry to go way pop culture on this, but there was an episode of The Simpsons where they were talking to Mr. Birds about how he had so many diseases that all of them were like caught in a doorway and so none of them could get through and it was a perfect balance but we just need to make sure that it's not too many so if there's one too many then you know it would be a huge problem but anyway um sea turtles they're being hit by the plastic pollution the climate change and um hunting well, and, and poaching and, so. and if a location like an atoll is where they lay their eggs by sea level change as oh, well yes. so <laughs> oh yes don't forget yes. that also yes, 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 yes. <laughs> uh but yeah so so the good news here is we have the opportunity to give animals in danger a head start before some of yeah. these larger issues start to impact them so a lot of animals are adaptable to one or two threats but you throw five at them and they their population starts to collapse so this is an yeah. example of a ban working, populations rising, and perhaps they will be able to uh, rise to the occasion when other threats come by. It's a good place to start. Yes, it's good news. It is. And yeah, not just Blairly. It's good news. I'll just take that as a piece okay. of hope. Not just for sea turtles, but for other animals on the brink. Um, and just really quickly as a, a brief, let you know some other cool scientific discoveries that are going on. Published in Nature Genetics this last week, researchers have uh, published their study, Systematic Reconstruction of Cellular Trajectories Across Mouse Embryos. So I talked about the egg being turned into an embryo earlier, but there's a lot of proliferation and diversification that goes on in that process between the blastocytes to uh, turning into an actual embryo and then into an actual organism. So what happens to the instructions that take cells and turn them into the various types of cells they're going to be? Researchers have created kind of maps of this kind of cellular transformation in other species before, like in uh, C. elegans, in worms, in uh, zebrafish. So in very sim like sim simple organisms that don't have a lot of tissues to diversify into. And so these researchers are really starting to look at some very complicated, um, very complicated mapping of tissues, of, uh, of, genetic instructions of mRNA that's involved, of the genes that are involved in turning different tissues into other tissues. And they're creating this really amazing map of the tissue change that is uh, the, just the very beginning. It's scratching the surface of being able to follow a tissue or a, a particular cell from its very initiation to where it ends up in the end organism. So they've mapped a bunch of different pathways and it's, I think, I think it's very cool. And the maps remind me somewhat of, you know, subway maps. <laughs> these, these cells are taking their trip <laughs> and they're going to wind up wherever they end up in the final organism. But this is new information that is once again, very important for our understanding of development of different organ systems, of whole organisms, of being able to uh, treat diseases for understanding if something goes wrong at a crucial point in the cell division process. How is it going to affect tissues downstream? What kind of markers, targets therapeutically need to be approached in order to prevent disease or to fix disease? Um, 
and I'm not going to say cure because I know Justin will yell at me for that one, but <laughs> prevent. But prevent yes yeah but I, I find it a very interesting exciting study and um it is in nature genetics and you can read it if you want to pretty cool study oh my goodness this is this week in science thank you so much for joining us for another episode of this science talk show we're talking about all the science that we enjoy learning about and we hope that you enjoy learning about it too you want to say, share some of this science with a friend oh yes we are your water cooler. Share it with a friend today. All right. This week in science, we've got some very quick COVID update news. Uh, just want to report, as Blair was saying earlier, that uh, she, you've been listening to the radio every day this week and nobody's talking about COVID anymore. And the reality is, COVID's still with us. We just want to pretend that it's not too not, and we just we love having a distraction that is, you know, terrible in its own right. With lots of terrible things going on in the world right now, and there's a lot to pay attention to. So, um, just so you know, several European countries are seeing increases in COVID nineteen cases and hospitalizations, and it seems as though the gap between case numbers rising and hospitalization numbers rising is even less than it used to be. So it's much, much more tied together more in, in time. Um, the reasoning for this is so far, they think it is an increase in the Omicron variant BA2. And uh, in, in some cases, up to 75% of new cases are this Omicron variant, uh, which is Thought to be not shown definitively, but because it is spreading so much more rapidly, uh, seems to be supported that it is more transmissible than uh, the original Omicron variant even. And uh, yeah, so what does this mean for COVID generally? Well, Blair, what have you seen uh, doctors like Jeremy Faust saying? Oh, saying to uh, buy rapid tests and N95s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So people we trust uh, ha are, are starting to say that, you know, just be ready. We put our masks down temporarily. And like we said last week, our behavior is the thing that controls the uh, the spread of these viruses. And so your N95s, your KN95s are going to be your best protection. Well fitted, of course, if you can get them that way. And any mask is better than no mask, certainly. Um, and along those news, there, a study has come out looking at school mask mandates during the Delta variant uh, period of time. They found that mandatory masking in schools during the Delta, Delta spread lowered transmission of the Delta variant by 72%. What? <laughs> yes. And now with the increase in vaccination with the 5 to 12 year old uh, age range and also in uh, the spread of Omicron, researchers did say with the beginning of Omicron, the, the students that they're tracking, uh, they've got tens of thousands of students and staff across nine states, 61 districts answering the call. Um, uh, but they said that even short periods of mask removal, like lunchtime, result in higher transmission. Uh, also during the Delta wave, they're going to keep collecting data from schools, and uh, and and they and they said that it's a discussion that we need to be having. Uh, they have created also. So if you know people in the uh, in the school system. The researchers who have published this study looking at mask mandates in schools, they've created a tool for schools to use called Masking and Mitigation Considerations Calculator. It allows administrators to input their community COVID-19 rates of spread and determine how masking decisions in schools will affect case numbers because it was shown that case numbers in schools do affect community spread not massively, but by about 10%. So masking in schools can reduce community case numbers, can reduce spread, et cetera. So Kiki, can I ask you a question about BA2? Sure. Uh, so it seems like a lot of the United States got Omicron, like a lot. Yes, yeah. Is If they got BA1 of Omicron, 
are they protected from BA2 or do we not know? We don't know. We don't know. Um, and it also depends on the timing. It depends on the timing. So when you were infected could also impact it uh, as well. So we don't well, know. Well, our booster numbers are bad. So if you haven't gotten your booster, please go get it. Boosters are now um, people, uh, everyone 12 and older are eligible for boosters now, depending on how long it's been since your second dose or your final dose. And something so. that was brought up uh, on a political aspect of um, as politicians decide that the pandemic is over, <laughs> what that means is that they will let uh, emergency regulations lapse. And some of those emergency regulations aren't the regulations that mandate masks or close businesses, some of them are emergency regulations that allow for free health insurance. Uh -huh. So vaccines, boosters, the treatment, if you are intubated in the hospital for COVID-19, a lot of these things will not be covered anymore as soon as the uh, as soon as the emergency regulations lapse. And here in the United States, that could mean even less uptake of boosters and vaccines. And so this is uh, just something, good, the things good, that good, you good. don't know are yeah. important or you don't think of. <laughs> I, I wondered if there was something that, that wasn't being talked about widely in the press a few weeks ago because California brought back supplemental pay paid sick leave as Omicron was kind of like dying down. <laughs> And there was a part of me that was wondering, is there something going on here? Do they know something we don't know? It's very possible. California does have a tendency to create patchwork in state legislation to cover what the federal government lets lapse. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, there might be a little of that. Hey, but, you know, uh, before we think that this is over, you know, Obama just got COVID. Like, well, the know, queen like, got it. COVID last week, the right? The queen got COVID so. the week before. Like, it's still like you know, you know, there's still like a, a famous person list you can run through yeah. of who hasn't gotten it yet, kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At this point, I know Tom Hanks isn't on that list. No, because <sighs> he died. He was like the no. first death from no. it. <laughs> no, no, how dare you <laughs> no. say that about America's sweetheart? <laughs> This is This Week in Science. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode. If you do enjoy the show, please head over to twist.org and click on that Patreon link and help support the show moving forward. $10 and more a month. We're going to thank you by name at the end of the show. Help produce the show and keep this show going. We appreciate your support. We really can't do this show without you. All right, let's come on back with that part of the show that you know and love as Blair's Animal Corner. With Blair. She loves our creatures, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. Crap, that was me running to the animal corner <laughs> run to your corner Blair okay, so, run to your corner right. my first story uh is an amazing story one of my favorites of the year so far I think it is about smelly birds birds uh, aren't smelly well they preen all the time it turns out kiki perhaps they are <laughs> so actually they are anyone yeah. who owns birds knows they stink no, yeah go ahead <laughs> yeah it's true um so we have so many times on this show talked about the fact that you were told for so long i was told when i worked at a zoo as a teen that most birds have no sense of smell this is something that was considered kind of scientific consensus for so long. And then what happened, Kiki? They found the part of the brain that handles... They the, found the, it. The... Ha, ha, ha. They realized they'd been throwing it away. Yes. Yeah. The olfactory bulb. Yes. So they, they can smell. Birds can smell. Get out of here. Well, anyway, so that has opened this whole field of research where th there had not historically been research on smell 
olfactory communication between birds, anything related to smell and, and, and kind of any sort of strategy or social structure, or anything relating to smell in birds, because if they couldn't smell, why would they do these things? Right. And so in, in recent years, there have been papers coming out looking at smell and birds and how they might be using it and all of these kinds of things that we've been neglecting the whole time it was assumed that they they just had, didn't have the capability to smell. So the the latest, this one, uh, this piece of research from Bielefeld University is looking at their uropigial or preen gland. And the preen gland secretes an oil that birds spread on their feathers they do this several times a day. Throughout the day, they're preening themselves. As Kiki mentioned, they're keeping their feathers all nice. And that oil for a long time was thought to just help with kind of removal of dirt or mites and also um, helping to make their feathers uh, hydrophobic. So if it, if it rained on these birds, the, the water would just kind of roll off their back. So if you see like water off a duck's back, right? That's partially because of the oil that they are spreading over their feathers. And so we know all of these functions of the preen gland, and that was enough for a long time, but it turns out there might be others. And this all comes from a review of 187 studies. 55 of them investigated preen oil composition, and researchers found that there were differences among them. So the, the actual molecules in the preen oil differed between the sexes in half of the studies that they looked at, and it varied seasonally. So this could mean one of several things. <laughs> one, it could be camouflage based. They could be using it to uh, kind of hide their presence from predators. This could make sense seasonally because the seasons when this thing changed usually had to do with breeding season. And therefore, it could be related to when they were sitting on eggs, protecting their eggs. They can't run away when a predator comes by, so they have to hide. They have to hide visually. They also might be hiding smellily. <laughs> Yeah, that's olfactorily. That's a huge thing that humans don't really think about. When we think about hiding, we're like duck behind a thing. Good. I tried to hide an entire train car with smelly socks once. As a child? Uh, no, it was while backpacking. Well, while, while backpacking across Europe, we got a train car, my my partner and I at the time, and we wanted the full bench to sleep on. And we oh, didn't want I to have see. to share the train car. So we hadn't done laundry. So I hung our stinky socks up right over the door. <laughs> and people would open the door and then close it very quickly. I see. I see. So that's almost um, an offensive maneuver related yeah. to Most smell. Definitely offensive. Yeah, yeah, yes. yes. As opposed to a defensive maneuver where you want to blend in with your environment, right? But the other possibility is, again, because this often related to breeding season, this could be a chemical signal. It could be related to attracting a mate. It could be about whether you smell good. It could also be that there are cues to the genetics of the individual with that. So the whole I the, the, the t-shirt test, right? You think that somebody smells good after a workout because they are genetically dissimilar from you and therefore have good genes for recombination into offspring, right? And so there could be something about that here as well. So there's three different hypotheses here about what could be going on. Um, but there needs to be some study. This was just looking at past studies, looking at past studies on compositions of the preen oil. So now it's time to move forward. It's time to look at, um, taking samples during breeding season, record them during the different breeding stages, record how preen oil differs or is similar between successful and unsuccessful individuals. Um, look at whether, the preen oil composition is passed down to offspring. Is it genetic? Uh, also, yeah. 
look at things besides shorebirds. So a lot of the ones who had this seasonal change were shorebirds who nest on the ground, who are way more likely to get predated upon than birds who nest in a tree. So do birds that are less likely to be predated upon have the same changes in their preen oil? So it's just, it. this opens a whole new yeah, field of research. Which previously would never have been considered. Because yeah, birds can't smell or something. They can't smell. Mm. Why would they be smelling each other? I'm gonna uh love it. I'm gonna have to do the the uh, joke that was posted in the uh the chat room here by Kevin Ridden. Uh-huh. Uh, three birds are sitting on a wire. First bird says, My instinct says we should fly south. Second bird says, My instinct says we should fly north. Third bird says, My instincts too, but I have no idea where to fly. Yeah. <laughs> Funny. I liked it. So there's a story I didn't bring out of UC Davis yeah. this week uh, that was looking at redwood trees. Uh-huh. And they discovered... Oh, the leaves. Trees. Yeah, redwood trees have two distinct types of leaves. One that's focused on uh, photosynthesis and the other is uh, dedicated to absorbing water. Right. And can like take in something crazy like 14 gallons of water in a day or something just through these this other leaf that there's, you know, hundred thousand hundreds of thousands of on the on the tree but it's fascinating because we've studied redwood trees we've so been long. around redwood trees yeah and and i guess people looked at the other kind of uh funky looking leaf and just thought it was a malformed leaf like a leaf that hadn't of opened course. for some reason because it's just sort of tubular <laughs> as it sticks out mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. also noticed I'm sorry, redoing the story, starting the story a little bit, even though it's not here. They also noticed that it had they have different oil uh, or waxy coverings, depending mm -hmm. on their use, uh, depending on their climate, and that the uh, and depending on where they are, if they're in a wetter climate, those tubular ones are towards the bottom, no, towards the top, eh, towards the bottom. So they can collect uh, water. They there. can hold the water as opposed to so the evapotranspiration. The and, the, yeah. and the photosynthesis leaves tend to be towards the top of the canopy. That makes when sense. When it reverses in places where it's not rainy but foggy, then <laughs> mm -hmm. the tubular ones are pulling water out of the top of the tree. And you can actually tell the climate that that tree is supposed to be in based on where those leaves are. And something about the, they can actually just by looking, at the type of waxy residue on the leaves, determine what sort of climate it's uh, it's fighting to survive in, because that also changes whether it's repelling to get photosynthesis or whether that uh, it's absorbing water. Uh, right. So really fascinating thing, but that's another example. Of like redwood trees, the biggest oldest tree that's ever been. We've studied them in the Pacific Northwest. People have been studying these trees for years and years and years, and just completely wrote off. One mm -hmm. of the two types of leaves on the tree. Mm -hmm. Just ignored it. So yep. uh, great job, UC Davis, for... Uh, uh, go Davis! Uh, go Aggies! Go Mustangs! I don't even know what your thing is anymore. Uh, it's the Blair. Aggies. It's like a horse. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't, I don't know, know what it is. but <laughs> Agriculture, but they have a horse. I went there. I, I don't know. know. <laughs> I don't do the sports. I just did the science. Blair, you had one more animal. Yeah. Corner. Yeah. Uh, so another kind of area of study that I always like to bring to the show is related to preventing poaching. And I talked about poaching a little bit with the turtles already, mm -hmm. but I keep bringing it back to elephants because they are one of the most highly poached animals on the planet. Pangolin is the most poached mammal, but Elephants pretty high. As I say over and over, 96 elephants a day are killed for their ivory. Insane. Insane. Yeah. And so any way that we can find, any way that we can cut off the ivory supply at the source is going to help. This is part of the problem, right? Is if you illegalize selling the stuff, but you can't stop them from hunting it, then people will still buy it illegally. You have to stop it at the source. So how can you do that? Um, and so in, uh, in recent years, there have been explorations into DNA testing to try to figure out how to prevent poaching. Well, how does that work? In a University of Washington project, the researchers 
wanted to find a way to use DNA testing on elephant ivory to identify where the tusks came from and which ivory is related to which after I, yeah, this being is, this sold. is fascinating. They were able to track smuggling networks based on the the genetics of the that they pulled from the ivory. Right. So they looked at dozens of different ivory seizures and they found that the majority of smuggled ivory and the connections between those networks um are 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 pretty they're narrowed down to a very specific area. So they were able to see connections between ivory seizures across continents, find I kind of narrow it down to which port it came out of and which ivory samples are related, you know, siblings, cousins, etc. Because yeah. if they're closely related, then they probably came from the same area. So then from there, they can figure out not only which port it came from, but where in Africa likely that these these uh, tusks came from. They found that the majority of the networks behind large ivory shipments were from ports in Kenya, Uganda, and Nigeria. So already figuring that out, you can push the majority of your resources to checking shipments from those ports. Already, that is extremely helpful. Yep. They looked at 4,300 tusks from both forests and savanna elephants collected from 49 separate shipments in 12 different African nations between 2002 and 2019. And they found that most of them were related. So they were all coming from these three ports and a lot of them were related. They were all coming to back to the same populations year after year to get their ivory. So not only do you know which ports the ivory is coming out of, but you know which populations of elephants they keep targeting. Being predated on, yeah. Yeah, so now you know who to protect. So the, it helps you figure out where to search, but also which individual elephants to put your resources into to prevent poaching. Um, so they're also now the next step of this center's projects is to try to address this by training dogs to sniff for contraband at these ports without having to open shipping containers. They would blow air from the shipping container through odor collection pads, and then the dogs would smell the pads. <laughs> so they hope that this screening method would then be able to be used to detect um, illegal wildlife contraband, timber species, etc. cetera. So um, th they're using all these different things together, but I think what, what I, really I wanted to bring here was the idea that poachers are going back to the same populations of elephants over and over and over. They find a source, they're going to keep using it. Because if you think about, if I, if I was a poacher, I would not want to spend days, weeks, months finding another herd of elephants if I know where one herd is and what their patterns are over generations. Yeah. And I know how to get individual elephants out of that and get their ivory. So... That and then I, I, back of my mind, I would suspect that there's perhaps a little bit of, uh, what would you call it, bureaucratic cover. Uh, like I would, I would be, I would also want to sort of interrogate the the local authorities of yep, whatever there, reason yep. that is to see if there's a corruption thing taking place because it also. Aside from knowing where the population is, there's uh, would seem there to be are a routes. Sense of there are safety. people involved. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In, they know what their path of least resistance is. Totally, yeah. totally. So that that's right. So perhaps these ports are are not doing as good of a job of screening things, you know, intentionally or just because they don't have the right resources. Who knows? But um, then CITES can go in there and. And, and bring in their own kind of inspection forces to protect these animals. So cool. I really like the idea of using DNA to track down the elephants that need the most protections and the, the places where these items are being sent through. I love it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Use the DNA to our advantage. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. Justin, you're going to follow this up with some hot... Hot, hot science. Oh, gosh. Uh, let me get this. So hot, you're oh. on fire. Yeah. Fire bad. Fire yes. very, okay. very bad. 
Let me pull up my story. I so uh, I should have had that ready already. This pretty, do we have like waiting music? Can we put on the girl from Ipanipa for just a minute? <laughs> ba, ba, da, ba, da, ba, 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 Fires have gotten larger and more frequent and more widespread across the United States since the year 2000, according to a new University of Colorado Boulder led paper. So we kind of know like this, like it seems, it seems that way. You're, you're, every fire season seems to be like the most horrific fire season that we've ever seen. This is an actual published study in Science Advances. Paper shows that large fires have not only become more common, they are also spreading into new areas, impacting land that previously did not burn. To evaluate how the size, frequency, and extent of fires have changed in the United States, uh, researchers analyzed data from over 28,000 fires that occurred between 1984 and 2018 from the Monitoring Trends and Burn Severity database, which says it combines satellite imagery with the best available state and federal fire history records to give a, a picture of fire trends. Team found that there were more fires across all regions in the contiguous United States in 2005 to 2018 compared to the previous two decades. So this isn't just in the West. This is everywhere. Uh, in, the, in the West and in the East, fire frequency doubled. So if you were feeling like there was more fires in the fire season than when you were a child in those areas, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. It's twice as much. In the Great Plains, which you don't really think of anything, tornadoes, floods, what that's about it in the Great Plains, right? Fire frequency quadrupled. They have four times as many fires breaking out in the Great Plains regions in the United States. So as a result, the amount of land burned each year increased from a median of 1,500 to for, it was 1,500 square miles in the West. It is now 5,500 square miles in fire season. Uh, and, uh, and it went from 465 square miles of the Great Plains to 1,295. So that's, yeah, it's quite a bit. It's a lot. Research, yeah. Researchers also took a closer look at the most extreme fire events in each region. They found that in the West, in the Great Plains, the largest wildfires grew bigger and ignited more often in the 2000s than they had in the decades previously. Throughout the record, large fires were more likely to occur around the same time as other large fires. So a large fire by itself taxes the crews whose job it is to mitigate those fires. So having frequency of large fires occurring simultaneously is just devastating to your ability to fight them. Finally, the team discovered that the size of fire prone areas increased in all regions of the contiguous United States in the 2000s, meaning that not only is the distance between individual fires getting smaller than it was in the previous decades, but that fire is spreading into areas that didn't used to encounter uh, uh, burn seasons. Right. Places that you'd think would not be burned are now burning. Yeah. Uh, so unfortunately they say the results align with other troubling risk trends, such as the fact that development of natural hazard zones, development in natural hazards. So new housing is going up in places that were like, Oh yeah, that forest burns every couple of years. So instead they, they, you know, cut down the trees or whatever and started building houses there. Uh, yeah, that's also because it makes helping. so much sense. Yeah, we got to put the and people then, somewhere. Uh, Where are we going to put the people? Uh, I'm people. telling you, if you if you love if you if you love nature, people, and stay I know out of it. Do. I know you all do. Yeah, yep. uh, move to the biggest urban developed density city that you can find, mm -hmm. and stay away from it. Get as far away from nature you can go visit. And it'll still be there if you do that. 
But if you move into it, it's not nature anymore. It stops yeah. being nature. And then you've removed the nature from. The nature. Well, you, you have two. You have, I feel like you have lots of people, but you have two big different groups moving into natural spaces. You have wealthy people who want to live in nature because it's it's cush and it's nice and they get a giant house and it's lots of land and it keeps you yeah. away from all the people in the very dense urban places. Yeah, there's also yeah. people who can't afford to live where they work and get pushed yeah. into rural areas. Yeah, yeah, so, but that, you think rural areas is everything outside of the Bay Area, which is still cities. It's still we have running water, we have city services. Justin, the Santa Cruz Mountains burned. That's Bay Area. Those are people who yeah, commute to San have, Jose. And Santa Cruz Mountains, that is like mountain lion territory. That's the only thing that really that uses that. Raccoons no, and mountain humans lions. live there. That's what I'm talking about. People live That's there. People who have gotten priced out of living in San Jose live in the Santa Cruz mountains. That is a thing. So that's all I'm saying is that, that there is an, just like with other climate change issues, there are is they, a disproportionate are they, they level. But this, okay, this is tangential. This is, all, wondering, okay, sorry. Yeah. This is okay. all tangential. Yeah. <laughs> of course it is. This is part of yeah. So anyway, my last story of the night, fire good. Oh, really? Yeah, that was fire bad. And this is fire good. Uh, so, yeah, this is a study titled How Indigenous Burning Shaped the Klamath Forest for Millennia. It's published in Journal Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences, a UC Berkeley study. Combines scientific data with indigenous oral histories and ecological knowledge to show that the cultural burnings practices of the native people in the Klamath Mountains, the Karuk and Yurok tribes, helped shape the region's forests for about a thousand years before the European colonization made it out west. So the study found the forest biomass in the region used to be approximately half what it is now, and that cultural burnings by the tribes played a significant role in maintaining the forest structure and biodiversity. Even during uh, periods of climate variability, <clears throat> in fact, that's actually part of how they were out able to suss that it was uh, man-made fires looking back through the records. They, they, uh, they looked back through uh, some soil cores in lakes and they could see by pollen counts, diversity of fauna that they were there and by charcoal layers, they could see when there was big fires there. And they found that during wet seasons, there were actually sometimes more fires because the, the mm -hmm. wet seasons would aggregate more growth to the forest floor and then they would need to be burned sooner than in dry seasons. This is also linked to a recent study in Sierra Nevada found that density of trees in that region had increased dramatically over the past century by a factor of six to seven fold, six or seven times the amount of density of trees than there had been previously, which is also contributing to more. We had some really severe, like South Lake Tahoe almost caught fire. Right. So much of the of the Sierras was ablaze in the in the past year. Study focused and, and on there was yeah. also the the Rocky Mountains. So outside Colorado, mm. the 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 lands in the middle of winter, in the middle of December, it's wet, snowy season, and they had a massive, massive fire. Yeah, so to estimate how the forest biomass near the lakes had changed, because they went to the couple of these uh, fish lakes, uh, they did the the pollen grains and sediment level core samples to 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 sort of research the past to get a glimpse of it. it says uh, co-author Frank Lake, research ecologist of the U.S. Forest Service and a Kruk descendant, growing up among Kruk and New York tribes. Uh, in many cases, the ethnographic information actually helped explain both the geographic and temporal patterns in the fire history records. For example, fire scars found near the lakes suggested that fires occurred more often near Fish Lake than Lake Ogoramtak, can't pronounce it, sorry, uh, it, which is consistent with accounts that the areas and lakes were used for different tribal purposes, in addition, right. patterns in fire frequency and fire Enforced biomass during the cool 
wet little ice age also indicated a significant human influence on the forest. This is quoting one of the researchers. If you're trying to detect a signal of induced fire due to human stewardship, having a cooler, wetter climate is a perfect time to do so because it will really stand out in the record. And that's exactly what we found. More charcoal accumulation, more charcoal production, so therefore more fires and decreases in biomass that correspond with that fire. And it, for those who aren't familiar, uh, Native American controlled burns were just common out West. That was the practice of the Native uh, peoples. Common across the United States, cr common across North America, really. Yeah. <laughs> so, so then... <laughs> Right? And then it was outlawed. Practice. It was outlawed yeah. by the the invading, uh, you know, uh, post European populations. So those two studies uh, just kind of brought those out there too, because the first one that's mentioning how fires are just getting worse everywhere doesn't mention the fact that for a thousand years there was stewardship taking place. The second one does focus on that, thankfully. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's getting worse. The stewardship was definitely a part and we didn't, you know, didn't know how to manage and we thought our way was better and we didn't do it correctly. And I remember the interview that we had uh, about the tree rings, the uh, woman who wrote a book about uh, tree rings, den the dendrochronology and how she found that there were in the tree rings, burn scars. And those burn scars went back and some of these trees were super old. And then it's these major fires that have started burning, these super fires that have started happening that actually take the trees out and they have, but these, these trees actually have scars within themselves that go back hundreds and hundreds of years, not hundreds and hundreds, but go back decades, decades, decades. They, well, they, they can't. I mean, if you're if you're yeah. talking about a redwood, which is a very yeah. fire resistant tree, uh, I mean, it's it, it can handle uh, fire. And, mm -hmm. uh, it likes fire. Uh, it's to, good for the seeds. It loves the fire. This is how, yeah. how we get more trees. Um, yeah. Then you could be talking about a record that goes back, you know, yeah. a thousand years. Really. You yeah. could be you're further. You, you really can. Uh, you really can't get some history out of that old growth. Yeah. So I think the the good news is here, there's more and more research related to this happening. And there's also more and more efforts to reconnect to the native yeah. peoples, um, especially in wilderness areas, national parks, state parks, county parks. And so um, a, there is, an, it, there is an, an effort right now to try to build these partnerships, learn from the people who were the real stewards of this land before us and, and, and try to, to grow through that and start to, to take those lessons to heart. Well, it's also, would, we have my... to get past the damage that we've done already mm -hmm. by allowing the understory to grow to such a point that you have these major fires that we now have to deal with across yeah. millions of acres of land. And now we have to figure out how to get past that to get it back to a place where it's sustainable, because that's part of the problem. And, and uh, c climate change is compounding that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a number of issues. Yeah. And, you know, climate change is a tricky one, too, because we like the idea of forests being a carbon sink. And so you think more forest, the better, the denser, the better. And then having to burn it to manage it sounds like you're working in the wrong direction. So it's that's really tough. But I would just like to point out uh, the people who managed before are still here. But maybe the solution is to transfer the land back to those people who managed it for thousands of years before. <laughs> and yeah. and and make it. And that's happening in some their cases. land. Yeah. It, yeah. Yep, these things, these kinds of things are starting to happen, and it's it's mm -hmm. promising. Um, but like you said, Justin, there is actually I was looking for the link to your story, and there's another story out of Oregon State University. This is huge forest fires that don't kill the living trees, don't release as much carbon as we think they do into the atmosphere. So the trees that burn, yes, they're releasing biomass they're releasing yeah. carbon into the atmosphere but the ones that survive they're keeping the carbon so it's not they they said that 
in this paper in forests, they discovered that uh, the estimates of how much carbon dioxide was being released into the atmosphere didn't match with, with what they were actually seeing. And so they did this study and they discovered that, lo and behold, living trees hold on to their carbon. Which is yeah, and, and you know, you're also the spreading growth because you've made the forest more open. So there's more new growth, which is actually taking down uh, carbons quicker. Also, one of the interesting things is putting that, it in the that, ground. I guess it's it, part of the one of the other things they found in the 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 indigenous controlled burn uh, story was that uh, you end up with more fast burn because you were talking about the scarrings. When you do controlled burnings, you end up with a forest that is made up of those more fire resistant hardwoods. And so that when the lightning strike thing happens, it's not in a fast burning wood scenario. It's also in a fire resistant tree environment. And so you don't get those out of control fires that are taking place today. It's, if you do the controlled one, you don't have the out of control one later. So. So fire good, fire bad. Just a... This week in science, good. Good. I'm just going to keep it there. This week in science, good. We hope you're enjoying this show. I have a couple more stories here. Let's talk about brains. We've talked about the, the slow brains, forests, trees. Those are the slow brains on the planet. Let's talk about fast electrical brains <sighs> and how, how, oh, how, oh, how do mice, how do we know what's going on in the world. So one thing about mice, very interesting. Uh, we didn't know previously whether or not they could look at a picture of an object and transfer that to a memory or a recognition of a real world object. So say you see a picture of a chair and then you, you come to a chair as a person, you go, oh, I saw a chair in that picture. That looks exactly, it's a chair. It's the same thing. And so you can transfer information gained from a two-dimensional symbol or representation of something in the real world. You can transfer that to three-dimensional and vice versa. You can take your three-dimensional world stuff and stick it in two dimensions. And we are fine with all of this. And Part of the brain that's involved in navigating this transfer of information between multiple dimensions is the hippocampus. Hippocampus of the brain is also part of uh, navigation, allowing us to understand where we are in space. It's also involved in creating memories. Very important area of the brain for so many reasons. Well, researchers wanted to find out uh, what other animals out there can actually take this transference and and make it work they've never tried it on mice before and so they said hey let's do this let's let's put mice in a situation where we measure from their brains we're going to measure their hippocampus and we're also going to give them pictures of things and then we're going to test them on the real things and lo and behold dun, 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 uh, the hippocampus definitely involved when they um, used a sedative in the brain injected directly into the hippocampus, muscimol. It reduced activity of the hippocampus and it reduced the ability of mice to be able to make this transference from two-dimensional to three-dimensional. But in just the general knowledge, which is very interesting, these, these mice were able to just look at, look at pictures and recognize objects in the real world. So look at pictures within a sample area. And then when the pictures were replaced with three-dimensional objects, they recognize them. How'd they know they recognize them? Well, novelty is interesting. And so the object that had the picture that had been replaced with an object they had never seen before was the object that was investigated the most, the mice ignored the object that they had seen in the picture yeah, because it wasn't novel. Huh. So this is kind of a correlation. The way that we can get an idea that they're really making this transference from 2D to 3D is the fact that the, the hippocampus seemed to activate in the appropriate manner, the way that we know that human hippocampus activates. Um, but I don't know. It's very interesting. 
this question of, you know, you look at a picture on the wall and you're able to know, oh, it's my family. And you can have memories associated with it. You write you, you know, there's a lot of stuff we associate with pictures, with symbols. And it's interesting to know that another mammal who doesn't have any reason to use pictures can still transfer a picture to an object. This test design is tough. I have a suggestion for another experiment. <laughs> okay. So you you train them to, you give them like two or three different objects and you train them to pick a, pick a particular one to get a treat. And then you replace them all with pictures. And vice versa. Mm -hmm. Do they pick the picture of the thing for the treat? It's, I would uh, really, have to make sure that they're not just learning about where the treats are, right? You have to say so you have to like carefully well, but balance it so that they'd be there's not associating always it there, and yeah, right. Like if I if I had a glove, a thumbtack, and a post-it note, and if every time they walked over to the glove, they got a treat, and then I had pictures of a glove, and a thumbtack, and a post-it note. Right. And then they went to the, the picture of the glove and got a treat, right? That would mean they think it's the same thing. As long as it's not in the same location, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. See, I yeah. I question whether or not this is actually showing that they can't distinguish between uh, uh, 2D and 3. Look, if I had if I had a picture on my wall of the Mona Lisa that I walked by on a daily basis, and then walking by and there's a woman who looks very much uh, like the Mona Lisa standing there, I would be very much intrigued and think that was very novel. Right? As yeah. opposed to somebody else saying, that, right? Like that, like, I'm, I don't know. I think that would be a little bit more like I've identified that it was two dimensional. I get the kind of familiarization thing of, uh, of the image replaced by the object. But I, I guess, I guess I don't know if that's doing a distinguishing thing. To me, it almost sounds like they couldn't really. Well, it's a, yeah, know. I mean, they, they, they could tell that the object in the picture was the same as the three dimensional object in their room. Yeah. And but weren't it all freaked out about the fact that the two dimensional object is just poofed into three dimensions? Suddenly dimension. turned. Like, that would be, <laughs> how did that happen? Know. Would be the first thing you'd it's want to investigate. It's the real Mona Lisa. Yeah, what's he doing here? <laughs> That's actually a very funny point. Um, you know, the big the big thing here is that if this study is actually determining this concept of 2D to 3D transference and conceptual, I guess, grokking or judging, um, then what it means is that mice have this capability that's really only previously been seen in primates. So maybe maybe Douglas Adams was right. Maybe we, we I mean we just need to be looking at the mice a lot more. Uh, another study in mice because you know researchers love mice so much. They want to solve all the problems and cure all the things in mice. Uh, researchers at the Salk Institute wanted to understand how we navigate social situations and how our brain identifies social rank. And an example that uh, is given is, say, you're, you know, you have a pizza and there's a pizza on the table. If you go into the room and your seven-year-old niece is, is in the room going for the pizza or, and your boss is in the room going for the pizza, you're very likely to jump in and snag a piece of pizza before your niece takes it because you're like, Psh niece, whatever. I'm going to eat that pizza. But you will recognize that your boss is your boss and maybe you'll let your boss have that slice of pizza and go get that pizza before you. I mean, it could be very different depending on you. What a jerk aunt or uncle. <laughs> what? Like, what? <laughs> God. But we have these social situations all the time and mammals, mammals live in these social environments and we figure out how to how to navigate social hierarchies and situations. And it's not always the same situation. And they just published a paper in Nature in which they 
looked at the brain and a particular area of the brain called the medial prefrontal cortex uh, and determined how it was involved in the mice representing social rank in their situations. So they put their they put mice in uh, social groups of about four mice, four to six mice. And then in those social groups, they let them kind of get used to each other. And then they made them kind of like round robin compete to get food. And they'd put one mouse up against another mouse. And while they were had mouse versus mouse, they uh, while they were doing this, they were recording with wireless brain recordings from the medial prefrontal cortex to see what kind of signals were happening. And what they found is that they could predict with like 95% accuracy, super high accuracy based on the activity in the prefrontal cortex, how an individual mouse was going to behave in the situation. And it came down to not necessarily the actual social hierarchies, but it came down to a particular mindset, and they're calling it the winning mindset. So even subordinate animals with particular signature of activity in their medial prefrontal cortex would go in there and take food, the huh. food more dominant mouse would, and they could predict it based on how active this area of the brain was. And so they're talking about this area of the brain. If you're going into a social situation and you're like feeling down on yourself or you're like, oh, whatever, you're already getting yourself out of that winning mindset. You have mm. your activity in that prefrontal, medial prefrontal cortex going. So be assertive is what I'm hearing. Yeah. Well, be yeah, assertive. Maybe it's, it's, it's actually, in, and it's interesting in what we conceive of as a non-conscious species of mouse that wouldn't necessarily say, oh, you're my boss, you're dominant, whatever. You know, it's those amorphous social th situations where even maybe you're you're kind of on even footing but some days you're not feeling it or other days you're feeling it more and it it comes through in your brain activity what were you going to yeah. say justin well i was gonna say like I, whatever that is like i wonder if it would register when i because i feel like i just always take the piece of pizza but not because of a winning attitude not because of a the, just because I wouldn't think <laughs> about the other person. You wouldn't even be noticing it. It's no. not on your radar. It's just weird. <laughs> like, I feel like this is also like the history of all the problems I've had at, at workplaces over the years, too, with bosses. Like, I don't, like, I don't really get the, the, that part that, uh, that you wouldn't take the piece of pizza. Like, you this is the boss. They probably provided the pizza, probably for the employees. That's why there's a pizza. What is he going to eat? He's going to provide pizza for the employees and then eat it all? No, that's for us anyway. What? A, yeah, he's going to go eat a fancy dinner later. He's the boss. My goodness. <laughs> well, I, I don't think I would not, think it. Like I don't think there'd you're be not a in register. competition like the mice were. No, I don't think it's a winning attitude. Uh, I feel like I feel like there's just a I, some sort of path of least resistance in this universe that I'm walking through that would just I would just take the piece of pizza without thinking about and the niece too, the niece too. Not because I'm a, trying to beat the niece to the pizza, but just uh, it's just like oh, it. you should be faster, learn reflexes. <laughs> so yeah, so is it winning or is it not being able to read social situations? <laughs> I think it's not caring. But so I it's, think it's not caring. Yeah, so it's gotta be <laughs> it's gotta be me. some combination though. If that's interesting, is you know, this is internal to the mice. And yeah. you know, like I said, there's the there is in normal situations, you would expect subservient mice to always let a dominant mouse win. But they said there are lots of situations in which this the subservient mice did not. They would actually go get the food first. And so what is it about that? They're more hungry. They've been, they've probably all been without food for the amount of, same amount of time. What is it that changes to create the signal that their computer program could, could see, would predict that that subservient mice 
mouse was going to go get the food and win the food out over the 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 dominant mouse. Like, what is it? I, and, and so I, and I, I, want, I bet I bet the same signal yeah. is happening in your brain. I want to know what the kind of long term success of these mice would be because on the one hand you mm -hmm. have better access to food because of the winning attitude but on right. the other hand do you have um a situation where their dynamic within their social group reflects this where there's maybe not as much give and take or as much care given to this individual, right? So this is the thing I'd be interested about is the long-term impact. If they keep ignoring social cues and taking food and, you know, pissing off other mice or rats, does that impact- We probably get leadership. We can get roles in management, mouse management roles. Does it? Or does it mean they get kicked out when there's communal food and, and they don't get told, right? So I don't- yeah. I think that would be- it. Because otherwise, why evolutionarily, why wouldn't they just all move this way? So, but there is a diversity in it. And, you know, and, and you culturally, if I was thinking about it, I don't know why I've got this picture of some uh, uh, meeting with a, a business group of uh, Japanese businessmen who were negotiating for something. And and you could see they there was the, the guy with seniority on their side of the table. And if he nodded, it was like, a chain event of everybody who was then the guy under him nodded and then the guy under him nodded. it was like you could, it was like a wave that went down this side of the table and it's just sort of the picture like i think there's also a societal thing where where people in some societies or cultures might put greater deference or weight to a business structure or a caste system or a military hierarchy of that sort of thing um so I wonder if they, then, because then I'm starting to think, is this a cultural affect and not a genetic? But it would affect? be, but it would be influenced. Different, different yeah, it group would be influenced. Mice. Yeah. So this is yeah, different <laughs> groups of mice. This is a group. These are yeah. groups of mice who were allowed to live together for a period of time before this competition started. So they created their hierarchies and uh, they they created their little society you know of their little yeah. their little tribe of mice and then they were put head to head to com 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 to compete and so then if, if you then took those mice and put them with other mice and made them get it together and do it over again would the same effect happen right. you know like would the same that, mice have the same results if you had that other group uh doing collaboration type thing for <laughs> like right you know, instead like, of competition the, yeah you social engineer them differently to have them doing different like social tasks or one's a more competitive task before they get into that environment and then see if those differences were actually like a, a evolutionary genetic based thing, or if it was a learned sort of uh, strategy, survival strategy. Uh, right. So yeah. Is it instinct or is it learned? And that's, yeah. that's, I think a very good question that they didn't answer, but with this, they were able to tell that, this area of the brain activity in it is indicative of social outcomes of of knowing like basically go, recognition of the hierarchical social status of the other individual in the situation and then making a plan based on it so this this brain region can be used yeah. in mice not in people this isn't in people but I mean, we have that brain area, so, hmm, hmm, and we're social. What does it mean? Nothing yet, but it's interesting hmm. to think about. It sure is. And that's all I've got for science stories. All right. Yeah. Did we do it? Did we do did it? We make it? Did, we, did we do it? Did we make it? Mm -hmm. I think we did. Uh -huh. Well, tight we... 120. Here we are. Woof. Yowza. Yowzas. We make it. We make it long. We make the science long and fun. So much fun. Thank you for listening, everyone. We hope that you enjoyed the show. I would love to shout out to people who help with the show, Fada. Thank you so much for social media and show notes, mm -hmm. show descriptions. Very, very helpful. Gord and Arnlor and others who help to keep the chat rooms above board. Thank you for all of your help there. 
Rachel, thank you for your amazing editing and assistance. And Identity4, thank you for recording the show. And additionally, I would love to thank our Patreon sponsors. Thank you to Richard Badge, Kent Northcote, Pierre Valazar, Ralphie Figueroa, John Ratnaswamy, Carl Kornfeld, Karen Tazi, Woody MS, Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Vega, Chef Stad, Hal Snyder, Donathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, John Lee, Ali Coffin, Maddie Perrin, Gaurav Sharma, Reagan, Don Mundus, Stephen Alberon, Dale Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fredus 104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Reardon, Noodles, Jack, Brian Carrington, Matt Face, Sean and Nina Lamb, John McKee, Greg, make, blah, 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 blah. Greg Riley, Mark Kessenflo, Gene Tellier, Steve Leesman, a.k.a. Zima, Ken Hayes, Harold Tan, Christopher Rapp, and Dana Pearson, Richard. Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Rami Day, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, Artyom, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Bob Coburn, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Mountain Sloth, Jim Drapeau, Stu Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, E.O., Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Steve DeBell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul Disney, David Simmerley, Patrick Pecker, Robert Tony Steele, and Jason Roberts. Thank you. <laughs> For supporting Twist <laughs> on Patreon. <laughs> and if any of you would like to support us on Patreon, head over to twist.org and click on the Patreon button. On next week's show. We will be back broadcasting Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time uh, or Thursday, 4 a.m. now, Central European time. Surprise! Broadcasting live from our YouTube and our Facebook channels and from twist.org slash live. Hey, do you want to listen to us as a podcast? Perhaps while you tend to your garden? Just search for This Week in Science if our podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe as well. Uh, for more information on anything you heard here today, show notes and links to stories will be available on our website, www.twist.org, uh, where you can uh, also sign up for a newsletter. You you can also contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or me, Blair, at blairbaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist TWIS in the starting line or your email will be spam filtered via a preen gland that covers up and camouflages the scent of said email and we will never sniff it out. <gasps> or you can uh, hit us up on the Twitter where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you'd like us to cover, address a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember... It's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Because it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one. One disclaimer, and it shouldn't be news, that what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just get understand. La, 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 la. It's the after show for the long show. Are you awake? Justin is gone. No. <sighs> <sighs> we made it through the show. Get Justin to maybe read the disclaimer. Maybe not. You did a great cold read. That's that fine. fine. 
It was fine. He forgot about a the eggs that humans lay. That's that's the one I always get in fights with people about. We lay eggs once a month. Mm-hmm. We it's don't just lay them. Tiny. I don't lay an egg. Like I don't. Well, you kind of do. Well, I don't like sit on a nest. And, no, like... but that's not the same as laying. <laughs> laying an egg is just it exiting. I know, but I feel like laying an egg is where the bird has the nest and they put the egg in it special. And it's just very, it's a very, very complex behavior in my brain. Mm. Not just the body passing well, this thing out. Some chickens don't take care of their eggs at all. They just oh, let them fall wherever. I know. I just, I'm thankful that we don't have hard shells on our eggs yes, because truth. like laying eggs is hard enough as it is without putting a calcium shell around that sucker. Word. Right. Yeah. I know they make it hard enough. <laughs> hey, Gorov is asking, Blair, I missed huh. the first bit. I'm sure you all discussed ha, daylight ha, savings ha, time ha, already. Ha, ha. Yeah, so they passed it at the wrong time, guys. They did. It's a mess. The Senate passed to keep daylight savings time, which now I will remind everyone, it is currently daylight savings time, which is the altered time. We just left standard time. Yep. So if you were going to keep something, would you keep standard time? Or the messed up different thing? Obviously the messed up different thing because that's what the United States likes to do. So economists want daylight savings time to stay because mm -hmm. there is a belief, and I'm sure this is based in real numbers, I'm sure, I don't know, but that people will spend more money, go more places, stay out later, buy more things, eat out more, if it is light out later. In reality, the other issue is there is a wealth of science that tells us that standard time is better for our bodies. It is better for our telomeres. It is better for our immune system. It prevents depression. It standard time people from is being better. late to the show. It prevents yes. that. <laughs> it prevents accidents on the road because everyone's tired and it's dark all of a sudden. And selfishly, if I'm just talking about myself, I'm going to put all the science aside. I care way more about waking up and seeing the sun than about having one more hour of daylight when I'm out and about at night. Seriously. <sighs> The sun for me in the morning is one of the most important things. I mean, it. Yeah. it's well, like dimension. as the year goes and the morning gets darker and it's later, it, I mean, the sun comes up yeah. later and later and later. As that happens, it's like I am completely unable to get out of bed. <laughs> it's just like, I, I, why is it dark? I can't. No, I'm supposed to sleep when it's dark. I don't. And know. what about children that go to sleep now before it's dark out? Do they want to go to sleep when it's light out? They sure no, don't. No, they don't. No. Not it's to mention, mess you know, up parental life. What does it do to the babies that you've been sleep training over the last months? Justin? <laughs> uh, uh, so, n nothing. They curtains. don't care. They do it not depends care. They... where you are in no. your sleep training journey. Yes, definitely. Yeah, for a one-month-old, it doesn't matter. Correct. But for a kid, no. for a toddler, or for yeah. a young kid who's like, my parents want to stay, oh, it's light outside, why do I have to go to bed? Yeah, it can be very hard. It totally matters, especially, yeah, if you're trying to set up a particular nap schedule or anything like that. It could absolutely matter. Yes, for you, time means nothing right now. I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> time is a flat circle for the newborns i understand but um yes if you're working on sleep training uh, there's that also you know animals my dog doesn't understand yeah. Yeah. that that changed no yeah that's doesn't hilarious uh you mentioned that because i had a, as a as a youth i had a donkey a mule 
Uh, that was that lived in the backyard. This is uh, uh, Quincy, California. Yeah. Hashtag, sort of hashtag classic Davis, right? Not Davis. This <laughs> oh. was this was uh, this is Quincy, California. Quincy. Uh, so totally normal. We had a, a pen uh, back there, a little corral back there for the for the mule, and and yeah, the mule woke up like clockwork, a uh, half hour before my alarm was set every morning. And then, uh, you know, and start uh, uh, like time to feed me. Come on. What are you doing? And so I got and then the daylight save didn't care. It didn't it didn't switch. Nope. It didn't switch with the clock. It's like, nope. no, what are you doing? It's now it's too early. What are you? Ah, I can't get up. Get I up. also wake up the whole neighborhood, too. It wasn't just my. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, see, that neighborhood worker. should have petitioned to not have the time changed. That is, that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> make, make the mule stop. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think the one, there were a couple of studies, however, that did show there were uh, areas that switched to uh, daylight savings time permanently for a while, and they they actually had an increase in deaths, hospitalizations, in all all cause injuries, like a whole bunch of things that were not great um, in the time. And when they switched back to standard time, those things mm -hmm. evened out again. Yeah. So I also want to call to attention here: if we keep da daylight savings time in December. It won't get light out until like 9 a.m. Yeah, it's going to switch it. So that's the other. So up here. So I think it was Identity 4 was saying he doesn't like the at night because it's dark early and you get out of work and it's dark when you get out of work. But with daylight savings time, it's going to be dark when you go to work. And it'll probably because we're so far north, it'll probably still be dark when you get out of work, at least with the way that mm -hmm. it was. There's just there's the possibility of maybe seeing sun in the morning. You know, there was. And now there's not. That was that was this weird affect. So I was working at a job that was all it was like 13 hour uh, night shifts. Mm -hmm. And and the sort of interesting thing, I just can't it didn't work. Um, not nocturnal like that. Uh, but, but one of the interesting aspects of it was I went to work when it was sunny. I got off work. It was sunny. And if I was, uh, up for any period of time in between, it was sunny out and it was kind of nice. It was like living That's in nice. a world of perpetual sun. Cause when you're in work and you're in the building and you can't just see, you're not even looking out. You the never window see it. It doesn't yeah. matter. It doesn't matter. You don't see anything. There's, you know, maybe, maybe that's the way to go is just all become nocturnal workers. And then <laughs> we have the sun all the time. Yeah. We're in all of our free time. And we'll never sleep. Eric Knapp, you're saying, yes, man. Eric Knapp up in Alaska. Yes. All this that we're talking about, totally normal for areas like Alaska, also. Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Finland, all these places that are very dark up in the, the northern uh, the northern circle yeah. region. It just, you know, there's some places where it's very, very dark almost all day long. Very, very light almost all winter. day long in and the then, winter. Yeah, and then it switches yeah. to where the mm -hmm. sun will be out here in the summer all the time and you, you won't even notice that it gets dark. Yeah. Right. You have to have blackout curtains because you can't sleep because it's yeah, it'll be like out. 11 o'clock at night and it'll still be you know, you know nice sunny day out there. Right. So it's interesting because there are people who live in these extreme areas of, you know, daylight or darkness. And yet here we are in these kind of middle zones. And it, it's, you know, it's a concern. But I don't know. Um, whoever said it in the know. chat, who said it in the chat room? Um, oh yeah, the marked. Isn't time just a reference to when noon is? Yeah, that's standard time. <laughs> that's what standard time yeah. is. Why are we leaving that behind? It, oh, it makes no sense. I don't. 
At a, yeah, so you know, at a I, thought the, point, I thought the thing they always said was like, it's because the farmers want it, but the farmers are going to get up and the, care. The, the no, it doesn't matter. Don't care they're at all. Anyway, they're they up before to. the sun comes up every day. Anyhow, they're already working. They're working when the sun goes down. They're, they it's don't. It's for restaurants and malls. It's for restaurants and malls. That's mm-hmm. why they do it. That makes sense. And, and we don't use those anymore. So right. I guess we don't <laughs> Also, I don't. That never bothered me. Is that really a thing? Like, oh, sun went down. I'm not going to go out to dinner anymore. Is that really a thing? (laughs) Well, maybe if you're walking. I don't know. Uh, But, you know, it's hard to eat but just by candlelight, you know. So, yeah, when did this thing start anyway? I don't know. I I think it's more my budget. Electric light? How old is this? Yeah. No, it is strange. And then it's also strange that... We do it in the United States on a different timeline than than everyone else. Um, yeah, I experienced yeah, that I when noticed, I was living I abroad, that. and I suddenly had today. to wake up. And it's hour a week earlier. ahead. Yeah, it's a week ahead of everywhere else. No, two it's, weeks in the fall. It's like I want to say a full month ahead of yeah. Europe. Yeah, yeah, but I think yeah. I think so Europe it's... changes the week is two weeks after because we do we've done our science talk conference and we usually have rehearsals this week. And so it's like get the Europeans ready for our time change. And then the conference happens and it's still in the same time difference. And so nobody has to get used to anything new. And then the time change happens Mark. in Europe, like right after. So, so I, I never track even. these things. I guess I'm not. Uh, I, I, I'm like my phone just does it right my phone like that's how i find out it happened is that i didn't even notice it because my phone switched automatically my computers all switch automatically and i just feel like maybe i didn't get a great night's sleep or maybe i got a great night's sleep yeah but it's just i everything changed the clock changed i didn't know i didn't even notice uh but yeah the, of course everything right now is on central european time here so nothing changed what is Arizona? Arizona doesn't switch. Arizona yeah, was, they I don't do it. it. But yeah, good question. Are they on? Are they on they're on standard. Yeah, I think they're on Arizona's standard. on standard. So now I'm always going to be different from Arizona. We're now on, all on Arizona. Going to be on Arizona time. No, we're we're not. We're all not on Arizona time. Oh, now. we're not doing standard time. We're doing we're daylight doing, savings yeah. time. Right this now, is what I've been yelling savings. about the whole time. Oh, I see. I've kind of. <laughs> <laughs> is that we should be doing standard time because that's the standard the right one that's oh, normal gosh. time yep okay i didn't but realize instead, that doing the, the senate weekend. said keep it at daylight savings time year round and i was i was that's talking all my... they care about is the economy that's yeah. all they care about so Not I was talking me. to my dad yes, about this please. this morning, and he said that in 1973 they did this, but it yes. only lasted nine months because everyone got freaked out when it when was it got so dark. dark in the in the fall. And so they're like, "Never mind." <laughs> yes, and kids because pe- because families were sending their kids to school in the dark. Yeah, and everybody was like, "Oh, my kids are walking to school in the dark." Uh, duh. Duh. Uh, yeah, that's you just did duh. that. So why? So this is the thing. They only people talk about it now dumb. because they talk Love about it when you like lose it. the hour sleep, and that's all people seem to really care about, right? Is that you lost an hour sleep? When you go back to standard time, you get an extra hour sleep. So everyone's like, "Yeah!" So it, it's not front of mind, right? So they only think about it when daylight savings time happens, and that's where they're like, "Just keep it like this." No. <laughs> It's fine. At least I don't ever have to worry about trying to figure out the fall back, fall forward, spring back, spring fall back, back that, spring forward. Why see, is and that's cool? the problem. That is that uh, w- when you compress a spring, what happens? Springs back. Springs. That's that's why the, now that never helped me. <laughs> An analogy or that word. You're thinking it's too just, hard, just Justin. Little, it was confusing, <laughs> even with a little. I know, Gaurav, we, sh- we should be starting school later anyway. That's true. I mean, school but what about times work? are too early for kids. Work, we should because. start later and end earlier. Correct. We have less hours. Yes. Anyway. You're yeah. correct, but that will never happen. I think it would be great. Uh, in a survey of yes. 
in the survey of uh, happiest nations, you know how they do that every once in a while? There's, there's, there's a couple of trends. All the happiest nations uh, tend to be Western, which could be, you know, who values what kind of happiness more than other. They also all tend to be socialized countries where things like there's a lot of universal health care involved and that sort of thing. Another uh, trend, uh, two trends, uh, tend to have a more disposable income, but U.S. is pretty high on that list. Mm-hmm. U.S. doesn't make the top 10, by the way. Uh, but they also have shorter work weeks and more vac- so more vacation time as well is a yeah. big part of that. Uh, and I bet they have paid sick life, life, too. Yeah. That makes people happy. Yeah. yeah. So there's a lot Longer of things. Longer parental if, leave, all that good stuff. Yes. That's a, so, uh, and, and in some cases, uh, completely covered child care uh, mm-hmm. is, is part of mm. you know, like universal child care. So there's a lot of things that if we wanted to be happy, we could be voting for or initiating his policies. But we don't because America doesn't prioritize. Likes to be unhappy. Happiness. That's not a priority. <laughs> Well-being, quality of life, not the priorities in this country. No, no, we're going to focus on corporate. Just work harder. Lines. Just work harder, everybody. Work harder. Let's just be work harder. Then, oh, I have gone down the rabbit hole of anti-establishmentarianism. <sighs> Anti-disestablishmentarianism, the longest Anti- word. Anti-disestablishmentarianism, yes. Um, I still am uh, agog at the word grok that you brought up earlier. I'd never heard it before, and I had to look it up, and now I'm really excited about it. Grok is a fantastic word, and its grok. history is wonderful, too. Um, yeah. Empathize. Okay, so what? Yeah. No. So it just means to understand something mm-hmm. intuitively or empathetically. Mm-hmm. Establish yep. rapport. Grok. What's the What's the origin? Yeah. So uh, it was from uh, science fiction. Uh, oh, Stranger was... in a Strange Land. Yeah, Heinlein. <gasps> yeah. Yeah, so Concept it was a word spell? that was part of the lexicon. Okay, so it's a it's it in indicates a concept of self transcendent experience and emergent identification beyond those of many subject object assumptions. It's a lot of words. <laughs> uh, I just want to point out, Kev Kev B in the chat room is pointing out something. Average workday should start thirty minutes after all the schools start and end when the yeah. schools get out. Yeah, like yeah. there's also like this really ridiculous uh, way to construct a society where you have kids yeah. that need to be in school for all the child rearing portions of your population. They got to get the kids into school and they got to pick them up after school. Uh, but you have a work day that's longer than the like it doesn't match up. You can't parent. You just simply it aren't it's just, it's like one of those it's a catch twenty two. Mm-hmm. It's set up for a um for a stay at home parent. That's what it's set up for. That's it's, where it all yeah, started. Yeah, it's set up for having a stay at home parent. You're yeah. right. And if we're yeah. going to charge rents for two incomes, right, we need work weeks that match. Right. Mm-hmm. The yeah. the other problem is that the thing that I, I say that. over and over and over and over is that automation and the internet and technology have allowed us to do our work four times as fast as we used to, at least. But that means we have to do four times as much work, not work a quarter of Less. the time, which yeah. is stupid. Yeah. And I will never forgive society for doing that. When we found out how to automate things and make things go faster and we didn't have to mail or fax and we could email, that shouldn't mean we do go more faster. work. Do more work. That go means you do more work. Home early. Yeah, that's how always how it's been. And, and you know, we, we used to have a way in the United States of making sure everybody could get a good paying job and, and support a family on it. But then we let women work. Which ruined the. Oh, you've been, the, the you've done that. You've, you've been down this one before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, my point though is if we, if we had a maximum work week of 30 hours, 
uh, every every big company would have to hire more people mm -hmm. to fill the roles and the hours that they yep. needed. So you'd have job creation mm -hmm. would be, you know, and then, and then, oh, but we don't have enough workers. Oh, well, then now we have a situation where the workers are worth more and can be paid a little bit more because now you definitely need to keep them. Yes. Hmm. Well, but that's the problem, Justin. Who's in charge? Unfortunately, yeah, well, not, not the us. People, apparently, yeah. no, not the people. Certainly yeah. not. I was just thinking. Patrick P says, "Hey, I liked having two hours parent-free growing up after school. It was a time to chillax." But I'm also seeing. Yeah, actually, how honestly, Patrick, when we were the latch because kids, I would have been horribly disappointed with my upbringing if there was always a parent around. That, that you're right. That was those were precious hours as a latch. Precious parent-free hours. Were some of the best hours but, of the day. But, but I'm just thinking how this has led into the uh, the work continued the work ethic where our generation of latchkey kids we were so proud of the responsibility of that key and everything mm -hmm. that key like meant and then we wanted to go into middle management because then we got to have the keys to the building <laughs> it's all about having the keys to the building and maybe if we just take the keys away from the kids no one will care about that anymore <laughs> I'm going to start a no keys for kids campaign. <laughs> yeah, everybody in my, my school looked up to the janitor because boy, he had a whole mess of keys. Boy, that guy's like the most responsible guy yes. we've ever seen. He's got that, so that ring of keys that they're jingle jangling around so you can open all the buildings. You can chillax in everybody's house. No, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's how the janitor did it. He was always like, you come home and then the janitor would already be there. And be like, oh, wow, you got a key to this house too, don't you? Yeah, it's just a phenomenon, man. Old days. Uh, oh, yeah. Identity 4 says that uh, I can solve all of this. Kids stay in school all day and night forever. Adults stay at work all day and night forever. Schools and office buildings have no windows. Makes none of this a problem anymore. Well, isn't that the whole point of like the tech companies having like the chill sofas and nap couches and laundry oh, and leave. food? It's yes, so you don't leave. You. Yeah. 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 There's they, a, they actually make a you think it's to make a nice atmosphere and, and you know. There's a regulation uh, in Denmark. I think it applies yep. to all forms of office space. So it definitely applies to lab space, but I think it's all mm. forms of office spaces that they have to have to have a window. And it might be even multiple windows because you see this weird phenomenon of a window to the outside. And if that is missing, right, you have windows to other areas. It might be window to another office. It might be a window to the hallway. But you ha you cannot have an enclosed space without windows, uh, and any and I think it might even be like two windows. It's like some really weird thing where you. I wonder if that's for emergency it... egress. Has got to be what it's for, right? No, I th no, no, it's for it's mental for... health. Yeah, yeah, wow. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's mental health built into the architecture. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Which is very different from a lot of the architecture. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there were so many classrooms that I spent so many hours in that didn't have any windows. Yeah. Did you hear? I, I haven't looked up to see what's happening with the construction project down at UC Santa Barbara, I think, is the university. Uh, there is a donor who donated a, a chunk of money toward a new uh, student housing building with, but it wasn't even enough money to build the whole thing. But anyway, the money came with, you know, the poison pill that he got to design the building. And he designed the whole building, like basically with double rows or like stacked with like lots of rows of, of student apartments with no windows, like basically to pack more housing into the building. So he had this idea of 
make having certain aspects of the building with no windows and just kind of having big LCD, uh, big screen TVs that like showed scenes of outdoors. Oh, <laughs> oh my oh, God. Horrible. But this something topic. happened because of the money and people, but I, I, I lost, I lost track of what was going on with it. It was probably about six so, months ago. Last time I checked in on it, but. So there a, is a, there is a building. They in, actually build it. <laughs> there is a building that was built in Denmark that uh, I'm going to mess this up a little bit, but it's a, like a very green building. It, it was with very green design, open spaces, windows, uh, open architecture plans, all this sort of thing. Uh, sustainable materials were used and it's designed to be as self-sustainable a building as possible. I think they do water collection, there's solar, there's all this sort of stuff. Right? They didn't put in bathrooms and somehow the thing got built without bathrooms. So I guess it had been designed, but it was still like undetermined where to put the bathrooms, but the final design got built without a restroom. And this is a large building. This is like, you know, like uh, 80 offices or something like that. It's like, it's like, it's like it's decent enough size building that you would expect there to be multiple bathrooms down multiple hallways within some sort of walking distance of the, of the people but it was built completely somehow i don't know how that guy can even miss that in our architectural plan no <laughs> bathrooms got built into it uh wow yeah might be pretty but you can very pretty but there's no facilities for you yeah. It's like uh, building that uh, uh, vaulted ceilings everywhere uh, into, a, into a, an architect's draft. But then the, the building facilities people got to come in and put in like, hey, we got to put in like heat and air and pipes. There's all sorts of hardware that goes into a building. You can't just have the ceiling go all the way up and then start the next floor above it. Use a hole and then they end up having not vaulted ceilings in the end. Because you have to do all this building infrastructure. Anyways. Infrastructure. Yeah, so it looks yeah. like there isn't an update on Munger Hall since That's what December. It is, yeah. So I think mm. they're they're being real quiet right now. But the guy <laughs> did resign after the reveal of the lack of windows and lack of ventilation. Right. Like not and it's <laughs> you know, just drawing it on your little home architecture. Uh, 3D graphing thing, whatever it is. It's not how buildings are built. There's a whole infrastructure that needs to be put in there. It's like a living organism. You can't just build it without the the all the 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 uh oh god, what am I the trying stuff to say? that keeps people alive? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you can't build it without all the organs and the systems. Uh, required for a system. thing to be alive. Living buildings. Living dollhouse. They built Lots a dollhouse. Yeah. It, yes. A Lots windowless dollhouse. That, which is... <laughs> uh, with fake windows. Oh, God. Oh, my goodness. Oh, oh Munger. Yeah, oh, unless, here. unless you designed the building to look like a spaceship and we're wanting to, to be like part like experiment, like, uh, hey, can you live for a couple of semesters on a spaceship? Where, you well, know, that's what it is. It, yeah, it's a so it's a social experiment for sure. <laughs> yeah. Eight people to a room, almost oh, no windows, it. 40, oh, 4,500 students, two building exits. Yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah, that's just bad design. Yeah. Well, thankfully the person resigned. Hopefully they at least left the money on the table when they did. I don't know. Oh, we'll gosh. see. Gosh, it's awful. Yeah. <laughs> it really is. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. students. How is your box? It's like put I mean, I don't know. 
Are, oh, are they mice? Yeah. They're all uh, their students. I've seen some of the new student housing that they've been building uh, around uh, Copenhagen because they were they were uh, massively underhoused, I guess. Yeah. For a while, uh, it's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. It's like oh, these are like the sweetest little modular apartments with huge windows, nice nice view areas of the city, and they're absolutely like i want i'd love i would love to live in one of those things mm -hmm. and you see a student housing and then you're like oh i would totally do that that's that's good story. not this i would not live in this i would not do that no. i'd be miserable <laughs> i know <laughs> i don't know I, I, my basement is okay because i have a window right here and during the day the light comes in and i have another window right there and i see the light you don't I have to go to one of two exits to get outside. <laughs> and rush to those two exits with the 4,500 other students. Oh, my gosh. It's just insanity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It'll be interesting. I mean, people can get used to all sorts of things, but it's a very interesting question of, you know, the social experiments that, should be done or you know did we do them with the pandemic to kind of determine the kind of isolation that people can put up with for long periods of space travel <laughs> or the the isolation with very small groups of people and how those yeah. work out oh you need to travel for two and a half years before you get to your destination with eight other people <laughs> put me to sleep <laughs> There's also a phenomenon of just not even student housing, but like large apartment complexes, which are mm -hmm. a big thing around around in the university town. But they're all you know throughout the everywhere, North Central yeah. Valley, at least they're everywhere. <laughs> These big mm -hmm. sprawling apartment complexes, and and you know their their design uh, is really bad. Just like the the one that sort of get the types that you sort of see over and over again, mostly. Designed probably and built in the uh, you know late seventies, throughout the eighties, maybe even into the early nineties. Small windows, you know, yeah, it's it's tiny dwellings because it's an apartment. Maybe you can get uh, that's not the the worst. But then these like very cramped uh, floor plans where every room has a door, and so it's like you you go in and it's like oh here's all these doors. And they all go into small little cubicle areas. So it's like very closed uh, footprint, not an open footprint. And then the windows are the smallest windows. If you look at these apartments that have been built for the last few decades across the United States, I'm sure, there's no accommodating light or, or anything else that's like a human living environment. It's, that said... Again, I'm comparing Denmark, which seems to put a premium on these things. It probably has a regulation about them. But all these new apartment complexes that you see going up, gorgeous looking. You don't see the a whole lot of that same uh, thing being built over and over again. They all, Most of them seem like concept one-offs architects. Balconies, big windows, yeah. you, know, you know, nice open floor plans. It's being built for people. So I don't know who, what architects or economists or person putting up the money got to design the apartment complexes that are most common in the United States, but they're just horrible. They're utilitarian. They're not even. See, they're, like, I, I, so look, <laughs> they're just mean, got, right? If you got straight like Bauhaus utilitarian, <laughs> right. you would have ergonomic <laughs> open floor but it'd be also it'd be yeah. yeah it would it would be very uh efficient use of space these are inefficient uses of space right that are like interesting soul yeah. crushing in 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 a lot of ways maybe it was intentional gosh could that be like people figured out oh this is how you make a nice house well yeah but then you don't want people uh, renting to be content with life so let's make all housing horrible. <laughs> Identity 4 has copied and pasted 
that Munger Hall has a ventilation system that meets California building codes. Hmm. Fresh air is provided, fresh outside air is provided for all rooms at twice the volume required by the California building and mechanical codes. To balance air pressures, the fresh air is mechanically exhausted to the roof from the suites, galleries, kitchens, and great rooms, resulting in no recirculated air, which in a post-COVID-19 world is highly beneficial to building occupants. Mm -hmm. But you also don't have windows. Okay. Major yeah. Not very many windows except on the outside of the building. Do those windows open? Um, what happens when there's an earthquake? Santa Barbara. It's possible. You have an earthquake. The power goes out. The doors lock. You can't because they're all on key code thingies <laughs> nowadays. And the ventilation <laughs> systems stop working. <laughs> so, what happens to the air in those buildings? <laughs> and 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 I'm sorry. Did I hear right that it was eight people per room? Like eight yeah. people would be assigned to sleep in the same room? That's yeah. not possible. <laughs> Having two people sharing a room is tough that's a tough yeah. thing having eight people share a room to sleep in impossible absolutely well, it, looked like they're, it looked like they're like little um like bed cubicle like you have a closet that your bed mattress platform is in and then there's like a looks like there's a central place and so it's like there's eight spots these are humans, not extra <laughs> pairs of shoes. These aren't the winter boots. And the, you don't just jam them into a closet and forget they're there. No, 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 no. So no, first no, thing no. we no, need to no, do. No, 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 no. First thing we need to do is, is, is for America. Brutalist is a thing, Eric. Yeah. First is thing what? we need to do for America is come hire away all these Danish architects who are building. They might even not be Danish. <laughs> I don't even know who to say. But Wherever the apartments they're coming that are being from. built here are absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. They're amazing. And 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 do that instead. And then everybody who's still building those old uh, soul-crushing, inefficient space <laughs> usage, thing, you find out who's got that. Burn the blueprints. Fire the people who built them last time. And if we can find the people who actually designed them, I'm sure they're long gone. I think this is their one. They was like, I'll do this. Yeah, take that world. They'll build this for 100 years. Ha! They're probably long gone. It was probably their last act of aggression towards society was, was designing <laughs> those, those apartment spaces. Oh, I don't know. As as. Populations are going to keep continue increasing for a while. Then they'll start coming down again. But in the meantime, as they increase, wait, we do have to figure out where we're going to put what people. What do you know? What? Wait, what do you know? What? What's what? decreasing? Population will decrease within the next. Well, not from where we are now, but by twenty one hundred. It's decreased over the last two years. Well, not enough to make a difference. <laughs> What's going to happen that's In going the billions to of people. decrease? I'm very confused, Kiki. So uh, the International Health Metrics Evaluation uh, uh, Group, they have determined that with, and also the other people like the UN oh, gosh, and other groups have determined this? that with increases in education for women and family planning, throughout the world, um, and also uh, basically improvements in reproductive health for women around the world, that uh, there will be reductions in birth rates, similar to like okay. what Jap Japan already has, what the United States is in the process of, uh, of hitting, and many countries around the world are going to see decreasing birth rates. And so what's going to happen is, even though it's kind of like the ocean heating up right now, even though, you know, we've, we, we're starting to slow stuff down. There's still a lot of inertia in terms of uh, large countries with their growth, growth rates. So Africa, um, India, China, like those areas are going to continue growing substantially for a long time, even as other countries are coming down. So we're going to end up going up to like 
eight or nine billion people, maybe 10 billion. We might peak out at 10 billion, but then it'll start dropping. Um, that's still too many. But yeah, because, the estimates because, right yeah. now suggest it's going to drop to about eight eight and a half billion by 2100 that's gonna be really okay. strange to have like that much of a decrease right over... i mean right now we're not that high so it's an increase from where we are now right, right. But it's, it's but I'm gonna just go about up and then go down again the the earth adjusting yeah. to having 10 million 10 billion people yeah and then it going back down to eight yeah in Less a than a hundred years. Yeah, in less than a hundred years yeah. is catastrophic. Like that means you create infrastructure and space right. and um and jobs and all this yeah. stuff for two billion people that will disappear. There will be yep. space left. Yep. So because what's gonna be is is populations are aging. And so as populations age, there's decreasing birth rates. Yeah. Um, and so you have those populations then start to decline. Yeah. So it's this really, it's a really I, interesting wave, but that's a very interesting point that you made. That's, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I, that I, aspect okay. I hadn't thought about. So for part of the volcano study, we're talking about the 1814 uh, volcano in mm -hmm. Indonesia. And I looked it up because I was curious because they said this many people died, but I was like, wow, how many people were alive? It was about a billion people on the planet 200 years ago. 1 billion. We're now at 8 billion. Mm -hmm. My prediction is we're going to be at around 64 billion people in 200 years. Or attempting to be. Nope. That would be my, like, I don't see anything that's really, 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 really slowing it down. No, but that's exactly it, is it's um, aging populations and re reductions in birth people. rate. As as what yes but as <laughs> yes new people but what's happening in especially in in developed countries is that women become educated and they want to get a job or they want to do something other than just have children and you also have improvements in health and well-being for uh, for and so you don't have child mortality and so people don't have as many kids and so yeah. you have Basically, like we have, I think we have below the replication rate. So what they, the standard is, is 2.1 children is an increasing population rate. Um, but if it's less than that, then you have a decreasing population. And uh, the United States is like something like 1.7 or 8 right now, I think. And so it's starting to decline. Japan is really significantly low. I don't remember what their number is, but you can look at all of this stuff. The IHME, they actually have um, like they do projections and you can look at what their projections are for different years. And because of the, the replication number, you don't end up. And if the replication number decreases, decreases, decreases in more and more countries and you have aging populations, so you have people dying and then not as many people being born, suddenly you have a shift in your population and your population won't grow. It'll actually shrink. Hmm. And what's going to be a what's going to be the big problem, though? So someone in the, the chat room said um, that uh, that it's bad. Aging aging populations are bad for the economy. And that's true because fewer people are working. But the other side of it is that you don't have enough young people entering the workforce to take care of the older people. So the like anybody who wants to get into healthcare or into like helping elderly care, mm -hmm. <laughs> that is going to be a growing industry <laughs> for decades. <laughs> Part of the problem I always have with this, I've, I've, I guess I've heard of this before. Before, because the problem I'm, I'm having with this is that. What ends up then happening, based on this idea of more educated, more uh, women taking control of reproductive rights and that sort of thing, is that then the people who aren't having reproductive rights or, and or aren't educated reproduce a lot more than the educated uh, having rights people. And then it's just then they just they, they run uh, the 
governments and democracies, they become the general population of the world. And and there we go again. We're going to be right there. It's 60, I'm sticking to, I mean, hey, I'll give you the two Maybe billion. Maybe we need I'll better public education then. Billion, 62 billion people <laughs> no. in 200 years. Oh, okay. You, there's not, nobody's going to, it's actually hard work though. Because I, I think I figured out that I've only, I've only replaced humans. Even even through my that's right. You're working on replacement. You are. You're, I'm just you're... at replacement. I'm just at no. uh, steady state. Yeah. No. Do the you math. Are not. Yeah. Do the math. No, you have been yeah. in two reproductive relationships. Three reproductive three. relationships. Uh huh. Yes. Four kids. That's just replacement. Actually, yeah, maybe you're right. The math, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, it's like, I was, it's like, like, I was it's thinking like, yeah, of, yeah, that's yeah, really hard yeah. work. That's really hard work <laughs> to add more humans than, than the world started with. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, adding humans. I'm, I'm, I'm removing humans. I added one human. I'm not adding any more humans. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a decrease of one human. I'm at a solid negative two currently. <laughs> That's right. You're just, keep that negative rate here. We'll you're see. Good. But no, zero. this is just, but we should be yeah. encouraging, oh, Dr. Key. We should be telling Blair, no, we need more people raised by uh, Blair and Brian types. And so you should have like seven children. Go this for is it. my dad's, my dad's argument to me, like yeah, was his I, argument. To me well, that's for many, the, that's, many years. That's the plot of idiocracy, right? Is. is that the also people, the smart people aren't having children because they feel guilty about it or they wait too long yeah. or whatever, and then yeah. and the world becomes dumber. Yes. Well, that makes total sense. That's I think my yeah. objection. Uh and actually, <laughs> just just to throw this out there, Blair, because I know I I don't want to, I probably should have done this in the after show instead now, but that is just generally, not Blair. Pretend I didn't what? point at Blair and say this. <laughs> just generally, people, a listening audience, every year you don't have kids is the year less you will spend with your grandchildren. And at some point, that's the only reason you will get out of bed and live another day. Is to Thanks see for the somewhere. guilt. Justin? Thanks for the guilt. To I don't need so that. No, no, that's Thank not the, that was not the Blair. That's just not everybody can say. have okay. grandchildren. No, no, no. And I'm not saying like that's the whole point of life, but at some point that might be your only reason for living. Also, my generation is screwed monetarily in terms of caring for children. So that's a whole extra piece. Yeah, I think we were talking about that in the pre post post pre show at some point. We're designing a society against having children. It's really what America is becoming. I don't know. We need to have a little child climate change army. So, I mean, let's just all have the kids so they can all solve the climate change problem for us. That's, that's what I'm All the baby activists. So they can all get upset that we've handed them the bag. <laughs> I, yeah. yeah I say, well, well, then that's you why have to I sit had them down and explain. It, so, so let's go fix it, the, the alternative uh, <laughs> to ruining the planet. <laughs> As we is, as we saw it back then, it? was just not having more children, which would have been you. So that's kind of your fault. But it's, I think, a very just interesting the on the future. <laughs> oh, the I mean, the population is still growing. It's still going to impact climate change, and we're still going to continue to use resources, and we're not doing things sustainably. And so, the billions of people that we will still increase is not a good thing it's still going to be catastrophic to the to the ecosystems around the world but yeah. the one thing that i have learned over the last couple of years that i thought was so, it's so interesting is you know the whole idea of the population bomb it's not necessarily as true i mean it's because populations are losing their fertility because they're aging out because they're going to start shrinking it's not as big an issue. We just have to hurry it up to help get more women's reproductive education and rights into developing areas of the world so that they can get to the point of shrinking their populations faster. Because that would be good. 
Global equality. That's what we want. Eh, I, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. I mean, if you're, if you, if you're, uh, not necessarily. Every this country is, needs to have a country to look down on. Is that well, what you're I don't saying? Mean to, no, I don't mean to look down on, but I don't think we want to to take the world as it is now and make the standard the mean acceptable. We don't want the oh, average no, no. acceptable. Like that no, sounds like a horrible plan. Right? No, that's not. I. I... <laughs> That's not what I said. Okay. Oh, well, that's just all that's what I heard. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm gonna go to sleep now. Blair's already yeah. asleep. Yeah. She's I'm just gone. going through the motions. <laughs> I no, I I opened Twitter and I, I looked at uh what was trending. That's always interesting to see what's trending after the show because it changes. And uh I saw that John trending? Stewart How was often trending. Check in? And I My looked what's at trending it. trending never changes. Yeah, the the John Stewart's trending, and I found out why, and now I'm sad, and I just want to go to bed. Oh, oh no! Wait, now I have to me. look it up, and now then. Wait, what oh, is it? What man. is it? Just start, start. He has a new show on Apple TV or whatever, and yeah. I guess he said that um, fossil fuels are not our enemy. Oh yeah, no, John Stewart. By the way, uh, <laughs> be afraid of having idols who have writers. Yeah. Yeah, you're hella right uh, about John that. Stewart po post actually John Stewart before he had writers was uh, a horrible guy. <laughs> then he got writers on the Daily Show and was amazing. Yeah. And then he stopped having writers. Yeah. And became awful and again. And then he said those things about the vaccine that were terrible yeah. and now he's yeah. saying so, like so <laughs> you give the fossil fuel companies a break. <laughs> sometimes those people like i'm afraid to actually meet john oliver and find out that he doesn't believe anything right. that he talks about he's done behind anything in the show he's like i i don't I care do. about anything i've seen his stand-up so i feel pretty confident that that's yeah, really probably yeah, yeah yeah i know I'm, I'm i just want to know why my but, trending topics are not interesting like yours why does know. twitter think i want sports yeah i found out I that care. about john stewart and i found out that stephanie beatriz uh who performed uh, yeah. one of the Encanto songs? She recorded it while she was in labor. That's my trending. Oh, why do why I basketball? Look? Is this the a Dodgers. thing that we got to do now? Why I don't Twitter doesn't know me. Twitter doesn't care about me. Somebody's using your Twitter to look at sports stuff. I never do. Why is are it you logged trending? into an iPad in your house or something? No, okay. never. <laughs> All right, never. Seriously, it wants me to like know all sorts of things about what does it want me to know about? It wants me to know about fashion. Oh, I do like this. Simone Biles rocked a Y2K inspired chainmail dress for her 25th birthday. There you go. It was right. I don't know Paris why and I don't care why, but yeah, I've got I've got John Stewart. <sighs> no. Uh Ooh, something Stewart. trending in Panama. We have John Stewart. Shame, C H A M E. Have no idea. Oh, and you got you're hashtag in... NASA. Okay. I've got uh, Batman Jesus. <laughs> also trending in Panama. You know what? Actually, actually, Man Jesus. I'm looking I like at it. this list. Most of it is stuff trending in Panama. My this whole. So VPN now you should wonder. Situation, yeah, what's, what, 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 where's your confusing. VPN? Yeah, your VPN <laughs> thinks you're in Panama. I, I don't even, I don't even think I had it mm. on right now, but apparently, yeah. And it was like other things, like I went on to the, what do you call the, the, the Amazon to look uh, for a product, and, uh, and it said, do you want this sent to Lebanon? And I'm like, your address in Lebanon? I'm like, no, no, no I'm not anywhere. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Justin, change your passwords. I don't think it's passwords. <laughs> I think it's. I think it's like uh, sometimes I don't tell the VPN where to go, and I think it just chooses something. But it shouldn't even be on a VPN right now. I don't know. It's very confusing. <laughs> You're like this is a little bit weird. Okay. Oh, 
Mm. All right. I do, I am going to go to bed now. Now that I got depressed mm. about that. Time to go. <laughs> Okay. I'm just depressed okay. that I don't get to hear news like that. I've got DoorDash disrupted by Girl Scout or disrupted Girl Scout cookie sales. <sighs> of course it did. Okay. okay. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Wherever you are, I hope that you're getting the trending topics that you deserve. <laughs> or you know what? Just stay clear of Twitter's trending topics and go outside and smell the fresh air if that's possible. I can't believe that Jesus is just now trending in Panama. You would think like. <laughs> but you said Jesus. Batman that... Jesus. Batman Jesus. And yeah. Batman. <laughs> oh, no, that was it. That was too different. Oh, no, yeah, that'd be great. Batman Jesus. Yeah, you haven't seen that. It's the new movie coming out. Only in Panama. Batman. Say goodnight, Blair. Good night, Blair. Say goodnight, Justin. Good night, Justin. <gasps> good, good night, night Kiki. Kiki. Good night, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another fun night of This Week in Science. Science news from all of us to all of you. Have a great week. We will see you next week. Stay safe. Stay well. Stay curious. Bye. Not so curious.